尊敬的各位来宾，大家下午好，欢迎。Distinguished guests, good afternoon. Welcome to the third roundtable discussion. The theme of the third roundtable discussion is about Chinese stories and international practice. China's new narrative: How to shape and build up China's narrative? Uh, we know that as China's relations changes across the world, exploring the narrative of China's relations changes across the world. China's relations changes across the world. Explore the new way of telling the Chinese stories, becoming ever more important to the world. Just as our leaders has mentioned, we have become we actually transient. From a country who suffered from hunger and thirsty to a country suffered from criticism across the world, with the Chinese rising status across the world, we believe the power of the storytelling in China is quite different. And China is actually facing a very different images in the new world of media. Although we have some of the impact, but we are still lacking the international uh, in. In the international arenas of the storytellings, we have some of the uh, descriptions or narratives. But generally speaking, we believe there are several different aspects. The first one is that the Chinese ideologies and the systematic changes are unacceptable by the Westerners. And secondly, from the Chinese language is also very difficult to learn, and it's a little bit from the Latin languages in the English-speaking world. And that, of course, the Chinese way of image is also not matching Chinese fast rising status. Many of the country are afraid of the fast rising status, and for several different reasons. For the long term, people's uh, understanding ha people have a lot of misunderstanding toward the human rights issues in China, the Hong Kong and Tibet, and also Xinjiang issues in China. And actually, the Chinese overseas image is actually facing ever more challenges. And we are thinking that this kind of a new narrative may be widened in the future. So how do we grab the way of the Chinese way of storytelling? How do we match the ever rising Chinese status? Definitely, the Chinese government has understood these stories. Not too long ago, on the 31st of May, General Secretary Xi Jinping has even noted, issued a notice to promote the Chinese way of storytelling and promoting the Chinese way of publicity. That's the reason why today we have invited several different experts, who some of them might come from the media perspectives, some of them is actually coming from the academicians. Some of them are coming from the publishers or academicians. They are gathered here to discuss the mutual trust and the lovable Chinese image, and how do we build a new Chinese narratives to match the ever rising international status of China?、Uh, so, without further ado, I like to throw out these questions, and we are going to invite all the distinguished experts according to the arrangement. The first, for the first round, I like to invite all the experts to spend three to five minutes to speak their ideas. The first speaker is Dr. David Blair, who is a high-level economist who used to be a columnist in the China Daily. He is、uh, from the United States, and he used to work in Aston Harville Economic School, and he is actually a high-level researcher in Harvard University. Dr. David Blair, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mabel. I'm I'm very happy to talk about this issue because I I think the next decade is likely to be a a crucial and a dangerous decade. The 2020s are shaping up in a way. The situation now reminds me of the dangers that I saw back around the year 1980, but possibly worse.、Uh, At that time, th there looked like there was a danger that the Cold War could become hot between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and also the U.S. economy was looking very bad. We had very high inflation, 
very high unemployment. We went through a serious recession. I think we're facing the same kind of situation. There are, there are many downside risks in the coming decade. Um, the, the U.S. is currently running un, unprecedented, ex, unprecedentedly expansive monetary and fiscal policy. I hope this works out, but it's a grand experiment and it could go very wrong. So we, should, we could be facing a very difficult uh, economic situation. The U.S. political system is very unstable. We haven't seen median wages rise in the U.S. since 1979. Uh, politics is the most unstable I've seen in my lifetime. And on top of that, we're seeing the rise of China, China becoming at least one of the two or three big players in the world. And we're seeing uncertainty in a lot of people's minds about the effects of technology, the effects of globalization. So there, it may be that everything that we muddle through and everything works out, but there are lots of downside risk in the coming decade. And I think misunderstanding China could make those downside risks much worse. Um, the, the thing about the situation of telling China's story in the United States right now is that the U.S. press is the most narrative-driven I have ever seen it before. They, they used to be political. You could tell that each channel had its own political bias, but now they're very driven by a predetermined narrative, and they're not going to deviate from that narrative. They will cherry, I'm talking about probably both sides, but they will cherry pick a story, both the domestic story and an, inter and an international story, and they're going to tell the results that they've predetermined. That's my view of what's going on. So it's very difficult to, to change people's minds about China. And unfortunately, in the U.S. major press, both the conservative press and the uh, sort of the mainstream press, there's not many positive stories about China. I've been told that they're not allowed to tell positive stories about China. This was not true 10 years ago. Um, and this didn't start with Trump. It really started, my view is it started about 2013, 2014, uh, and it's continuing through today. Um, so what do we do about it? First of all, we're not gonna change the nature of the American press overnight. Maybe over time we can, but that's not going to happen in the short term. Um, what, again, what can we do? First, first of all, it's not all just about messaging. There are many things that China could do that would calm things down. I mean, I'm not giving advice to any, any government, but I would say you know, calming down border disagreements, anything of that sort could eliminate the ability of, of the press to tell a negative story. Also, sort of, as, as President Xi Jinping pointed out, sort of don't feed the beast. Uh, in a time, I think the wolf, the so-called wolf warriors that President Xi talked about, did a lot of damage because they created the hook for a negative story over and over and over again. So just calming things down looking at this dangerous decade, I think could be very important. But for the Chinese press, I think the point about telling stories is very important. I think many people in the West don't have an understanding of what life is like in China. Just stories about ordinary people building businesses, building their lives, that's the kind of story that sort of touches people's hearts. Maybe movies, maybe short videos, that kind of thing I think is much more effective than talking about policy. I see him, I'm, I'm running out of time. As I say, this is, a, this is a difficult task we're facing, but I think it's a very important one because people in the West and people in China need to understand each other to avoid the, the big dangers that I see as possibilities in the next 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. Telling story, telling the Chinese story is quite important. Um, next, we would like to invite Mr. Mario Cavallo. Um, Mr. Car uh, Mr. Mario Cavallo is the CEO of M Communication Group, Communications and Media Agency. 
and he published and uh, wrote some articles and books on Chinese stories. So uh, next, we would like you have your speech. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mabel. Talking today in this roundtable of shaping China's narratives, international communications, and beyond. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Appreciation and blessings to everyone, to each and every one of you here today, especially everyone with CCG. Henry, Mabel, thank you for hosting our important roundtable and also the wonderful CCG team. They are working hard day and night, taking great care of us. With respect to messaging and communication, more effective response can serve to shut down the problem. Well, when I speak about the problem, what am I speaking about? The problem, of course, being the problem of preposterous vilification found in the key China narratives. In response, messages need to be, I'll suggest, three points, passionately crafted, precisely crafted, and unequivocal and demonstrable in their response. Let's consider two messaging strategies and two egregious examples. Strategy number one, actions speak louder than words. Well, you know, the Chinese government is actually very, very good at this, and I sort of agree with it. It's an unequivocal message when the Chinese government, for example, recently cracks down on uh, has, uh, what's been in the news cycle recently has been the regulatory crackdown. We're referring, I'm referring to Tencent and Didi and Meituan. Uh, it may not be perfect. Some may say that they're biting off more than they can chew at one time, should take things a little bit slower. Nevertheless, the messaging is crystal clear and unequivocal, and there was no press release needed. Okay. We will protect the delivery workers from Meituan, and that's more important than the billions that you want to uh, raise in your IPO for the shareholders and the billionaires. So the message is society, not shareholders, and it's unequivocal. And no words are required. A decision is made, and everyone says, what was that, and clearly gets the message. Okay, right or wrong, perfect or imperfect. Moving on to number two, specifically egregious cases require a crafted and precise and unequivocal response. The first example is the example of the United States State Department making the following quoted statement. I'm quoting the United States State Department, okay? And that is, China continues its brutal, and violent repression of religions of all faiths. That's a quote coming from the State Department, from someone like Mike Pompeo. It's written on their site, and it's verbally stated. I can't imagine it, I can't believe it, because as I'm reading it, I'm sitting in the Catholic Church in China. You see the meaning. So this is absurd, but where's the response? The strength of response is not there. And what I want to suggest is comes from my background here in China, which revolves around three countries. Italy, where my family immigrated to the United States and the United States became their home, and then I left the United States 21 years ago, and China became my home. Well, guess what? I'm Italian, so I'm an Italian Catholic, so let me teach you an old trick. It's called Catholic guilt. Okay? And what I mean to say is to craft a message that is so clear and so unequivocal that what it does is that it heaps biblical hot coals of shame upon their heads for having the nerve to say such an untrue thing about China. Shame them, embarrass them, but do it in a precisely and clear crafted message so that frankly, whether they respond to it or not, doesn't make any difference. You've already made your point by shaming them by heaping coals of shame on their head for saying such egregious things. For saying the same thing, example number two, about Uyghur forced labor, okay? Uyghur forced labor. When you can respond and say, we don't, we will not tolerate these lies. As a country, we will not, our citizens won't, even the foreigners who live here won't, and here's why. 
Apple, Volkswagen, Muji, Coca-Cola, Esquel, Skechers, they have all said that they have done announced and unannounced audits over decades and have never found a forced labor violation. How dare you, the State Department, say otherwise? Shame them and embarrass them. Thank you, everyone, for listening to my thoughts today. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Um, Mario, as a uh, foreigner in China, uh, after the pandemic, he wrote a lot of good articles talking about his uh, uh, I remember that the CCG has uh, quoted his message a thousand uh, 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 the, uh, uh, millions of the uh, uh, supports. Uh, a lot of people they want to know the uh, uh, the real picture of China, how to precise, clear message. Next, uh, I would like to invite a researcher, uh, Ms. Professor Dong Guanpeng. Uh, Ms. Professor Dong Guanpeng is is the uh, uh, vice chairman of China Public Relationship Association. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, today I'm very honored to be able to be here. Actually, I'm from uh, Communication University of China as a university studying the communication. I'm also from China Public uh, uh, Relationships Association, a state spokesperson uh, from the government, from the company, all the person who want to bring, bene bring benefits to communication. Uh, this is a very good topic. A uh, new uh, China uh, nar narrative. We do not want to kidnap uh, with old stories. I talk with my colleagues. I want to share with you three points. First one, uh, what uh, I let's uh, I will talk about the challenge. Second, I want to talk about reason why we have the challenge. Number three, a simple proposal. I think there are four mismatch. First, China contribution and the China image, there is no mismatching. Uh, we believe that in some country, China's contribution to the world, the bigger uh, China's contribution to the world, the bad, in, the worst image it should be. Over the past 10 years, China's contribution to the world is getting larger and uh, China's image is getting worse and worse. Not in all the countries, but we see that this is a very unfortunate result. Uh, this world, uh, do we uh, encourage that we contribute less and the uh, image become better? That will be an observed world. Second is the mismatch between China's power and China's communication. Actually, uh, we need to uh, uh, ask, reflect on ourselves with China's power going up. Some Chinese companies in other countries believe we are strong. We do things. We don't waste any minutes. Our audit is very serious. Besides doing projects, we cannot uh, do have any budget to communication. It's different from other countries. Uh, if uh, other countries, when they want to invest, they will do human-to-human -human contact. They will uh, work with uh, local scholars. Some Chinese companies go to other countries just to build, build a bridge or build a building. After building the bridge, we left without any footprint, no sound left. We have made the concrete contribution, uh, but no communication. So uh, something we need to reflect upon. We have more power. We do more, talk less, only do l no talk. Uh, we do first uh, talk less. We do a good deed without leaving name, but after a long time, it's a problem. The more uh, we need to, uh, we have found out this problem. Uh, our association have done a lot of calling. We have organized many training courses to solve this problem. China, U.S., people-to-people, uh, -people, government-to-government mismatching. The colder the, the intergovernmental relationship, the hotter the inter-people uh, relationship. The, there's a cold uh, intergovernmental relationship, but uh, the people-to-people -people relationship is very hot. 
Number four is the mismatching between the demand of the world uh, uh, from China with uh, the content of chi China from other countries. When the world needs China, some country contains China. That's not that should not be the case. With the fourth mismatching, the biggest reason. Uh, the two biggest reasons is, first, the global system is not healthy. It's very unhealthy. At the same time, some leaders, they haven't uh, performed their duties. China, some scholars, we never want to challenge other countries to be leaders. We hope that the leadership can be better. A better leadership, we welcome, support the contributors, the builders, and innovators and self-discipliners. China is uh, uh, if ch China is uh, can, can uh, become a contributor suffered, no one will contribute anymore. Uh, China would like to do more, talk less. Uh, U.S., I think that they talk a lot, but listen less. I hope they can listen more. There are some ways about roadmaps. Uh, I would like to listen to your ideas and then uh, propose some of our ideas about the roadmap. Uh, very excellent remarks. Some mismatches and uh, the reason for the mismatches of, of the world. There is a big gap um, for China internationally, especially the developed countries. They have we have made a lot of contributions, but they don't like us. Uh, uh, it's difficult for other people to understand us. They don't believe us. China has made a lot of contribution to the world. China has become a uh, engine for the global economy. We are the second largest economies. We have alleviated 800 million people out of poverty. That's concrete result. But we don't have the equal communication power with our contribution. Sometimes we find out that maybe at this moment uh, our social organizations we need uh, different opinions, different people to uh, contribute ideas. Uh, now I would like to invite another senior speaker, who is the uh, Madam Qi Hongbo uh, from the Asian uh, Foundation. Uh, in China, he, she used to be a senior diplomat. He, she worked in the International Foundation for many years, especially for uh, the non-governmental relationship between China and the U.S. So I want you to talk from your perspective how to rebuild China's uh, narrative. Uh, thank you, Madam Miao, uh, Mabo. Thank you for your uh, contribution, uh, introduction to me. I'm very happy to be here, uh, especially uh, for China's uh, image and. Uh, being under great pressure in this forum, we talk about uh, how to shape the China's narrative. This is important. Asian Foundation was founded in 1954 in, in Los Angeles. We are an international NGO. At the very beginning, our purpose is to promote the communication between U.S. and Asia. Since the founding of, of the diplomatic relation between U.S. and China, we started projects. Uh, uh, we built our office in Beijing in the 1990s. Uh, with what we have been doing in Asia and in China, I want to say something. First, international communication, international image needs all-round participation. Different uh, communication uh, vendors uh, need to participate. The government should lead in the policy to have the cooperation to build a message of uh, the uh, the companies need to build a a uh, to perform the social obligations to realize the common development with the stakeholders ngo and uh, uh, foreign ngos in china uh, we can be the 
important power for promoting the people-to-people -people communication. Second, we need to tell good China story. We need to a lot of actions close to people. Some uh, uh, colleague said actions speak louder than words. We need more uh, private powers. As China's private powers going up, like China Power Alleviation Foundation, China Youth Development, uh, uh, development, all these uh, non-governmental organizations, these conduct the projects in other countries, including health, education, uh, disaster alleviation, environmental protection. They bring China's love to vulnerable groups in other countries. China's organization doing projects in other countries. We can bring some experience of the uh, uh, poverty alleviation to other countries, and uh, we can propose innovative su suggest solutions for other countries. When we do projects, we will go deep into the uh, the communities to face uh, we so face the local people that we can get close to local people and to enhance their uh, 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 their feeling about China. We hope we can do more. We hope we can get support from society and the government. Number three, in order to build a good international environment, we need to have more communication with other countries. This kind of communication is a long-term effort. It needs the joint investment from the country and from the private sectors. The Asia Foundation, back in the 1970s and 1990s, we started a scholarship for the young diplomats. And we have cumulatively awarded over 97 different countries and 97 different diplomats. And this is a project that is mostly mutual cooperation between China and the United States. Uh, State Councilor Yang Jiechi, when he used to be the ambassador of Chinese ambassador to the United States, he used to grant the award for that. Uh, scholar because we are a fundraising foundation. We continue to, we actually need to continue to draw the uh, investment from other different projects. And we also have another long raising, uh, long running project, which is called a Lewis Scholar Award. And every year we selected 18 different U.S. young, diplo young diplomats to come to China to for studies. And when we are trying to extend their understanding through China, and for many years, China is the most wanted and desirable destinations for the loose scholars. And we have arranged several thousands of the loose scholars to come to China and to learn Chinese. And with the funding and support of the Asia Foundations and the loose foundations, and for so many years, it has a very distinct result. So I hope that more and more funds, especially the fund from the private sectors of China and also the governmental investment could be thrown at such a long-term communication result. We do see some of the results, but we need to do more. Just as General Secretary Miao has directed the GYOD project in the CCG. It is also a very good project. I am um, also advertising and promoting the GYOD project. I hope that if we can promote such a project, it is also going to be very beneficial to the cross uh, country communications between China and the United States. The Asia Foundation is also very willing to participate in projects like this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mr. Ti Hongbo. I am always thinking that China is a very enriching country. Why can't we tell a very good story of ourselves? Because sometimes we are a country thinking about the collaborative experience. That's the reason why we need to present ourselves as one culture, one image to other different countries. That's the reason why I also think that we should present ourselves for the different regions and different peoples. And we should tell a very good stories of China. And this is also going to a very be a positive image to tell a good story of China. And later on, we can better tell the story of China that is going to be a very trustworthy, lo lovable, and I think if you are only demonstrating one image of a country to the other people, that is not going to be very conducive to the country's image. I hope that more and more people could understand our country and get in touch with our country. Now we like to invite 
Mr. Huang Renwei, the executive director of the Belt and Road Initiative and the Global Governance Research Institutions from Fudan University. He is also the former deputy director of Shanghai's Academy of Social Science. I have met Dr. Huang for many times, and there are so many years that he has been focusing on the telling a good story of China. It's my great pleasure to be here. Uh, the topic of this round table is uh, shaping China's narrative, uh, so-called narrative. Uh, I can put it into some kind of stories. And China's story is a difficult topic. Uh, different people have different stories. Who is telling China's story? Uh, in the international uh, press, uh, the media, uh, the stories of China are always mostly negative uh, than positive. Uh, when we read uh, the People's Daily, we find uh, only positive, no negative. So who is telling China's story? Telling uh, negative or telling positive? So very extremely divided on China's story. Today, I'm going to say a little about bad and the row, because my research work now is focused on bad and the row. And, uh, even, this, even this term of bad and the row is very confusing. Uh, one bad, one row. BRI, bad row initiative. Bad and the row. Uh, many different uh, uh, terms of this. But the story is more complicated on bad and the road. Some people, uh, like Financial Times, I, I, I just pick one example. Uh, they, they created a story of bad and the road, that is trap of debt. You see, all the bad road is a trap of debt. If the, some country want to have the projects of that bad and the road, they must be fallen into the trap of debt. And China used this trap of debt to control this country, and uh, they have to give up their sovereignty to China. So this is the story from Financial Times. When I talk with Financial Times, I say, what's your data? What's your base of this story? They said, for example, uh, Pakistan now is uh, uh, falling into very heavy burden of debt to China. Maybe 100 years, they cannot afford to pay back this debt. So, so Pakistan is in the trap of debt. I wonder, I visited Pakistan several times on the China-Pakistan corridor. We have invested in Pakistan more than three, uh, more than 30 billion U.S. dollar in Pakistan. This is a great number. If you say this is a trap of debt, is it true? Then we divided about 5% of this number is official assistance. That means China, uh, Pakistan won't pay back to China. And 20% is the loan from the bank. This is the debt they should pay for the 20% of 30 million, or 30 billion. And another 75% of all the number is the investment from China's company, China's enterprises to Pakistan. So this is not that. This is the investment from China and the China companies take their responsibility, their own responsibility for their investment. So you put all 30 billion together as debt. It's totally confusing about the concept of what is debt. Only 20% is debt, okay? So I told the, uh, uh, the editor of uh, Financial Times, you are the expert of finance. You cannot tell what the concept is debt. Okay? This is the one story. And other, many other stories, like geopolitics, uh, like uh, export our, uh, our, uh, our 
capability of production and, uh, and other many things, or, or export China models. Okay, so we cannot find the positive stories on West media about Belt and the Road. I'm, I'm sorry, the time is up. So tell, telling real story to understand the real situation on Belt and the Road and uh, made more mutual understanding on Belt and the Road and uh, know what we have done and what we have done good or not good or bad by ourselves. And also now recently, uh, Biden administration raised a new concept of B3W. This is uh, built, built better back uh, of the world. Uh, it's a new concept of infrastructure global wide. I think we should welcome. This is a new concept of global infrastructure. How, how about we work together on global infrastructure? This is broad sense of bad and wrong. So I don't think it's a bad idea if U.S. want to be more active, more positive on global infrastructure. So we're open to each other. Well, okay, I'm stuck here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Huang. Next, we would like to invite a very distinguished speaker. He is uh, Philip Kessery. Mr. Philip Kessery is a senior vice president of GM of International Education President from uh, Wiley, China. We know Wiley uh, is an uh, international group on publish and research and education. Uh, Mr. Philip was born in Hong Kong, China, worked in education sector of Korea, and has a special connection with Asia. Uh, three years ago, he has been moved to China and is now the senior VP for the International Education the President of Wiley China. So um, next, we would like to invite Mr. Kesri. Mabel, thank you very much for that welcome and thank you for, to the CCG group. Many, ladies and gentlemen, many, many uh, academics and experts in communications say that the international influence of media is closely related to the economic strength of the country, but there is a lag. And that lag is important because it leads to what uh, David Blair referred to as predetermined narratives. The world I live in is a world of publishing, research, and education. And for me, the best story about China is what China contributes to the world. But why is it the best kept secret in the world? It is absolutely extraordinary that in every single field of research, increasingly China is an enormous contributor. In many, many areas, the STEM areas and in healthcare, the article output from China is top in the world. It has overtaken even the United States. But what is actually even more um, impressive is that the level of the quality as cited has been increasing. So why has this happened? And my belief is that while there are many, many experts here about formal state level communication, I think that there are two areas where there needs to be more work, and they're of course related to storytelling. The first of these, in my view, is that from insider storytelling, there must be a recalibration to more outsider storytelling. And by that, what do I mean? I mean more informed foreigners who actually understand China, who see the day-to-day -day life in China, who see the impact of innovation, research, and education, how it is lifting an entire nation. That narrative needs to be told, not just by the Chinese, but by informed foreign people who understand this. The second, uh, related to, uh, the second thing that I believe is important and related to storytelling is that, of course, data is important. I'm a publisher. 
Data is the fuel of innovation. It is extremely important. It has to be correct. It has to be truthful. There has to be an ethical way of managing it and a way of actually um, being able to interpret it and use it. But data can also be frightening. The data that we hear about, the, the narrative is always about how China is the biggest, the strongest, is growing faster. And of course that's important, and all that information does continue to need to be shared. But there also needs to be a rebalancing from data to human storytelling, to the story of how all of this is actually translating into outcomes that change people's lives. So perhaps there are a million examples, but the one that is not too esoteric and not dealing with nuclear physics or areas where I might lose my audience is what happened in January 2020 when the COVID-19 genome was shared with the world in an open access article by Chinese researchers, which kicked off the sequencing, which led to countries working together to create a vaccine, which went on to lead to saving millions of life. This is one example that everyone knows about, but behind that, in research, in innovation, in education, there are tens of thousands of stories of what China is doing, and nobody really knows about it. What China is doing to collaborate, to actually drive forward research and innovation, with the outcome being better lives for everybody. So this is what I believe needs to be done in parallel with everything that is going on while this lag continues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Phillips Kastri. Um, yeah, actually he from the publishing world, uh, China need uh, not just the media and the public house to help China to tell story, not just the data and human stories, the vivid individual stories is quite important to telling Chinese story. And um, I think this has deeply impressed me, not only from the data and also from the numbers. Those are quite good. He also told us about the living stories in China, and this has improved me a lot. And I think if a Chinese people are telling a Chinese story, we need the international publishers to use the international language precisely to work together to help China to get some of the narratives in the international arena. I'd like to invite Mr. Ma Jun, the senior journalist of South China Morning Post. The uh, only uh, frontline reporter among the uh, our panelists, and uh, it's my actually my daily job to tell uh, China stories to an international audience. I'll try to share some of my uh, observations on the uh, working level. Uh, I think first of all we should uh, start by recognizing that the power to shape you know global narratives between uh, uh, Chinese media and Chinese companies uh, 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 compared to their Western counterparts uh, is to say uh, the least uh, asymmetric and the capacity is of course uh, uh, disproportionate to China's economic model. Uh, but does that mean there's nothing that could be, uh, that could be done uh, about that? I don't think so. I think um, a few weeks ago I went to this uh, book launch uh, by Dr. Wang Huiyao at CCG, and I think a panelist raised a very good point, and I'm quoting him here. Um, he said, in, uh, in, in, in the past few years, when China, uh, Chinese companies, Chinese media tell, their, uh, tell China stories, uh, they tend to emphasize a little bit too much on the uniqueness uh, of China, um, but not uh, so much on um, what China has in common with the rest of the world. Um, so China's uh, political system, economic model, its culture, everything is unique. And of course, that has, um, that has its own domestic consumption needs, uh, since China is not the only country that's known for its exceptionalism. <laughs> but uh, I guess what's, um, what's really lacking is the show of uh, empathy in telling these stories, in telling what uh, uh, China has in common with the rest of the world. And if you ask 
any working uh, journalist, um, you know, what is the key to successful uh, storytelling, they would tell you empathy uh, is very uh, important. And, uh, well, a, a good example I could think of is a very early example, um, actually from 2001, uh, this former uh, New Yorker uh, correspondent whose name is uh, Peter Hessler. So he, he wrote a book called um, The River Town, and one of my favorite chapter uh, in that book is how he, uh, uh, how he wrote about um, the, the, the students at his class preparing for Shakespeare show in English class. So uh, let's bear in mind that this, is, this book was uh, uh, published in 2001. That was even months before uh, China's accession to the WTO. And um, his students are mostly based in Fuling, now part of Chongqing. So uh, no first tier, second tier city at all. Um, and and, and he, he even called, the, the chapter was called uh, Shakespeare uh, with Chinese characteristics. And I love it. Um, and, and I think anyone who uh, finished reading that chapter will probably come up with a, uh, their conclusion uh, that maybe young people living in this part of China are not that different from the young people living in other, uh, other parts of the world. Um, they want better education. They want better lives uh, uh, compared to their uh, uh, parents' uh, generation. And they are sometimes uh, innovative about how to interpret Shakespeare play. Um, and I think this book is a great show of how, you know, uh, 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 empath uh, it's a great show of empathy, uh, empathy, and it show, shows a great deal of empathy to Chinese students in such a small place, uh, you know, in Fuling, and it shows a great deal of empathy to uh, maybe American readers or international readers who at that time probably had no idea what uh, uh, ordinary Chinese life uh, looks like. Um, and I, the second point I would like to bring up is to, uh, maybe I'm also speaking from the perspective of a reporter, uh, is that I think telling uh, good stories and activating change, uh, in my opinion, are two different things. Um, and uh, it's just like a very well-respected uh, investigative reporter once pointed out, uh, when he was asked, what kind of change are you activating? He was like, I'm not trying to activate any kind of change. If I were to activate anything at all, I am trying to activate education. Uh, so um, I guess that that was important. And uh, I think when we try to tell any China stories, I think we should bear in mind that we are trying to activate education and knowledge about what's actually going on uh, instead of trying to convince people uh, otherwise. Um, and because, uh, you know, changing people's opinions is not something that could be done with uh, storytelling itself. Um, that's what, not what uh, storytelling is meant for. So if the goal is not to um, change people's mind about certain things, but the goal is only to, for instance, if someone walk away uh, reading our stories and he would say, oh, it's actually a little bit more complicated than I thought, and I think that goal is good enough. I'll probably stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mai Jun. Um, uh, we can see that we have invited uh, different people who can help to tell China's stories to reshape China's narrative people. To, so from the panelists, you can see that as a, when we designed the round table, uh, what we were meant to do. Today, we are very happy to invite Mr. Sun Ming. Uh, uh, ACCWS, uh, which is uh, Ms. Sun, uh, right now as the Vice President. Uh, is the uh, Vice President of the uh, Academy of Contemporary China and the World Studies. Uh, uh, we proposed this project last dinner. We hope young people, young generation, I uh, hope that young generation can know more about China. This academy is a leading uh, uh, think tank for communication. Thank you, Madam Mabel. Uh, 
today we are going to talk about the uh, shaping uh, the uh, China's narratives. This is what we have been doing research about. There are three versions for international narrative. First, the story we want to tell. The third is uh, the objective story. The third version is the accidentally uh, negative uh, stories, because uh, there all the narratives is about the feelings. How we can have good stories, cherish the objective stories, and uh, to minimize the bad negative stories. First, I want to say is that through the observation of the past period of time, there are three important factors influencing the shaping of the narrative. First is international relationship. Many things happen in the first half of the year. International relationship determines the international opinion. International opinion affect the relationship. Uh, the communication is actually decided by hard uh, power. That's the first factor. The second factor is diversified value. Currently, with the collective value uh, based on uh, interest and the small micro uh, opinion uh, forming up, this kind of value is very scattered uh, with purpose, and the influence will be bigger. The third factor is the expression of the media. Now we has moved from the uh, one way to a uh, tailored uh, uh, message communication. It has become a prominent uh, feature of the global communication. Based on the three factors, when we want to reshape our narratives of China, we need to think about three issues. First, the agenda of the narrative. Second, the subject of narratives. The third is the value of the narrative currently. China's narrative is an important part of the global story. So when we design the agenda, we should follow the global agenda. During this process, we need to be objective about the world, about other countries, and the relationship between us and other countries. We need to find some common elements. For the issue of development, we may find the solution to show China's uh, direction. Second is. Uh, the self-narrative and the other stories should be combined together. It's, it's a question of who are doing the storytelling. Uh, we need to tell the story. Actually, under the current situation, the other people telling the story is also import important, especially when there is a gap. Like yesterday, uh, we have the International Youth Dialogue Forum. We need to make friends and to communicate more. To, uh, in order to do a good self uh, narrative and uh, to optimize the other people telling story, China's value should show international significance. There are two key words. Uh, one is rule-based uh, order. The second is the order-based ba uh, 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 value. These two topics we need to do in-depth uh, uh, thinking. As China stories. Uh, the people who know China are telling the stories. Some uh, people who do not know China, they are telling China stories as well. During this period, there are a lot of misunderstanding and uh, misjudgment. Uh, we need to think about it for the next step of the China's narrative. China narrative should have the uh, uh, vivid China spirit. We need to have the unity between uh, mind and idea, China government and the people, China and the world, the other world, and the s confidence and the modesty. So this is my sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Sun. Next, I want to invite uh, Professor Wang Hui. Professor Wang uh, and I share the same major. I used to uh, study uh, China's literature and the uh, narrative of Chinese literature. Uh, Wang Hui is one of the first professors and director of Tsinghua Institute. Uh, for, he is director of Tsinghua Institute for Advanced Study in Humanity and Social Science. At different uh, occasions, I talk with um, Professor Wang. I 
uh, I invited him to uh, participate in the CCG annual conference to ask him to talk about channelity. I hope he uh, know how to do the storytelling. He also studied China's politics and the China development model and the system. I hope that from different perspective, what is your view, Professor Wang? Thank you. Mabel, uh, today I'm very uh, uh, honored to share with you my view. Some, prof uh, some speakers have mentioned that as well. First, uh, we need to deal with two issues. Uh, first is about China's as a country, the unity and the diversified inside the country. The relation between the unity and the diversification. In China, we have our political system, we have the uh, unity. However, in terms of the uh, politics, economy, the culture is uh, seriously uneven. We have uh, internal diversity. How can we represent the diversity and show the problem, inside problem? People uh, become blind and the people will make narratives see you a part of the story. That's the challenge. I use, I work as the editor for magazines. At that time, there are a lot of conflicts of ideas. International intellectuals, they, they would like to come to our uh, organize to talk with China's intellectual community. This kind of uh, talk can show the diversity because the face-to-face -face, uh, distribute one, uh, about the narrative here is, is one way. The dialogue can show its own uh, outlook. So it's more than narrative. We need to show how we need to show the diversification. Second is we need to deal with China's uniqueness of society and China's challenge and the problem as well as the global challenge as well. Uh, basically, China and uh, uh, Western, we have huge difference in terms of uh, political system, historic traditions, but the basic challenges are the same. We talk about the ecological issues, health issues, racial disputes, uh, social dis uh, the imbalance, regional imbalance, they are the basic challenges for everybody in the world. Uh, what so what problems of China are global? What China's challenges are unique? Uh, so we need to emphasize the globalization. It is necessary, for example, racial disputes, religion challenge. So it's complicated. It's a more than a China issue. It's a global issue. When we talk about the Xinjiang, part of that are related to the Afghanistan war and the change uh, post-Afghanistan war. We cannot make it a special issue in China. We need to point out the uniqueness, and we also talk about the relationship uh, with other issues. That will be convincing. So for China's narratives, we cannot be in, we have been influenced uh, a lot more by the U.S. narratives. There are a lot of books about power, uh, great power's contribution in 19th century, 20th century in China and non-Western countries. That's the, uh, that refers to uh, imperialism and uh, co colonies. So when we, our countries talk about the power, it's just the colony and the host countries. But in China's, uh, it, it is global power's competition. So uh, what are the values behind? We need to reshape. We need to redefine. So language trap is one issue. Uh, when we learn a lot knowledge from Western countries, we need to differentiate them. We need to t tell. So who we are going to tell our story to? China's media focus much on U.S. and the power, great powers of Western countries. We need to convince the, the Americans, the West, the Europe's. When we talk uh, for our neighbors, for third world, for Asian, uh, uh, African, Latin American, we did not enough study, and our story to them are not enough. For these regions, their narratives their star languages, they use the West, uh, the textbooks from Western countries. We need to do a lot of work in this area. 
Another point is the basic academic research and its relation with the contemporary narrative. We need to focus on the academic research. It's more than a narrative and a publicity. Uh, it is about the basic research uh, in different regions, our own history. On the basis of that, we can have the convincing, uh, uh, the uh, uh, complex, the diversified the narrative. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wang Hui, for your wonderful presentation. Four points are very valuable about integrity and diversification and the dialogue per se as a part as a kind of narrative. You also talk about the great power. We need to tell the nature of this world, the connotation of the world, and the basic academic research about culture and history. Very inspiring. Next, uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Professor Wang Yiwei, who is the uh, uh, Jin Meng Chair Professor, Director of Institute of International Affairs, Renmin University. Uh, we have seen Professor Wang Yiwei a lot about China's narrative. He has done study uh, in early stage. I want to thank uh, CCG's invitation at uh, Mabel. It's a very good uh, topic, China narrative, China story. To think about this issue, why we need a new uh, narrative. Before, China solved China's problem. Rousseau Russell wrote a book about the China problem. Actually, it's a Chinese problems, independence, prosperity. After reform opening up, we need to solve the problem, the global issue happening in China. Today, we need to solve the humankind the challenges. We need to change the mindset. This year, we issued the White Book, the China Practice for Humankind Poverty Relations. So it's more than China poverty alleviation. That's the new narrative. We need to tell a good China story. We need to tell a good uh, American story and the Western uh, story. And we have Xilin telling the story of Australia and the U.S. That's a new phenomenon. China, U.S., China, Western technology for and, uh, the, uh, we have the competition for technology narrative uh, governance. Uh, some American people, they blame China for their internal issues. China sometimes maybe take the U.S. as a uh, scapegoat for its the domestic issues as well. Uh, the second I want to talk about uh, China's narrative, basically the two civilizations. I hope you can you need to read uh, President Xi Jinping's speech on the first uh, of July. First, uh, we need to understand the Communist Party from Chi uh, Chinese civilization. We combine Marxism, Marxism with China's reality, and uh, we combine the. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, traditional excellent country to China. So China is more than a country, civilization. Uh, Communist Party is a more than a party, is a civilization. That's important. You need to understand if you want to understand China. So new form of for civilization, we have created a new form for humankind civilization. That's the core idea for the Xi speech. This time, the uh, pandemic vaccine, our view about uh, about the, like the uh, old man, women are created equal, are uh, born equal. Currently, where life comes from, uh, people first, life first, is related to uh, uh, China. The digitalization, uh, the facial recognition is uh, one risk or multi risk, very sensitive issues. Number three, uh, the climate change from uh, mankind, uh, lifestyle, and the uh, mindset uh, the we have the carbon nutri uh, nutrition. But in UI, they don't change their lifestyle. Uh, you, 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 they only change the production. So we want to build a trustable, admirable, and lovable trend as a civil, civil, how people can uh, and, uh, trust you. Some people say you don't believe in God. How people can believe him? So we are a civil, uh, the, uh, uh, 
So it's an active concept if we don't, but in China, we respect all the gods, not we don't believe God. So this is a new kind of uh, gods. Uh, Western narratives, so they want to uh, solve the bond between China and the uh, and the God, what we, we in China, we want to solve the unity between China, the, the heaven and the, and the earth. Second, the lovable, China's culture and history very good, but our politics are not good. Communist Party not good. Harvey Mas, uh, he made a very clear dif difference between civil society in China. We don't have a lot of civil society or NGO because it, since the Qin Dynasty, two thousand years, we have a unity. Western people don't believe the unity. They say dictatorship of the Communist Party. It's not to understand the Communist Party from the governance. It's democracy of dictatorship. It's the very narrow understanding about China. The third is admirable China. We say admire the God but leave them alone. But in China, they aspire China, but they don't get close to China, like surrounding countries. How they can admire China and get close to China? When we will not be a product of Western country, they take China as adversary. Before they engage, they want to change China like a part of Western community. Now they want to re-engage China into the human community. Then we can solve the problem, but China uh, we are from tradition to more than to global China. We need to make the shift as well. So 24 the values, one third for tradition, one third for modern, one third for global. So China is a uh, complex. Uh, we need to adjust ourselves, both China and the foreign uh, Western. We need to make good narrative, not for China, but for Western. We need to rebuild a new civilization. Then we can build ourselves. That will be the same for Western and the U.S. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wang Yiwei. And he actually talks about a problem that I have always talked about. The introductions of the Communist Party of China is also very key to understand the modern China. How to understand the Communist Party of China? It is a modern party. It is also being closely related to the Chinese civilizations and Professor Wang has a very key understanding toward that. How to let the world understand the Chinese stories and how will we let the Chinese Confucius culture be better understood across the world? And it is a development models that we are in urgent need. And internationally speaking, the understanding toward the Communist Party of China has is actually not very precisive. The Communist Party of China has always been stick to the multiple party development. And we have a democratic party to tell the stories of China and also tell the stories of the Communist Party of China. We need to let them to tell the real story of China. And it also includes that there is a huge gap between the developing countries and developed e economy. We need to understand the Chinese circumstances better. The Chinese image is not getting better. It is actually getting worse. But domestically speaking, there are so many domestic organizations. And also, the Chinese people have an ever-rising satisfaction toward the ruling of the, the Communist Party of China. So what is the gap here? So it is something that worse, bigger. It is something that's actually worse pondering in China. And how do we meet up with the gap? It is not only for the self-development of China, it is also a very important topic for the future development of the world. We really want to thank for the 10 speakers. Well, everyone have, uh, has one or two minutes to wrap up, OK? Um, we, from, uh, we also from uh, uh, the first uh, speaker, David. Um, I, I think one thing that the Chinese press needs to do is, is think clearly about how to convince people of what you're trying to say. Take their point of view into, into effect. I find that story, when I read stories in the Chinese press, 
I'm very impressed by sort of lifestyle stories and stories about poverty alleviation and stories about um, people doing innovation and things like that. I'm not impressed by a story that tries to tell me something or preach to me. So I, I think one, one thing that, if I'm giving advice to Chinese editors, I would say tell a story that you consider who your audience is. That there are many people that you're never going to convince. You know, Adam Smith said, uh, you can never convince, uh, I'm paraphrasing, you can never convince someone of something if the opposite, if his livelihood, if his lively, livelihood depends on the opposite. So there are many people that you're not going to change their minds. But the important thing is to change enough people's minds so that the countries can maintain good relations. The thing that scares me going forward is that a lot of the talk that I'm seeing in the U.S. press is, is picturing China as, as sort of being an enemy or a uh, sort of an evil enemy. And I think this is un... This is not correct. This is not, this is not something we have to go forward with. But how do you overcome that narrative? I think the only way to do that is to show people what life is really like here. I've, I've had the experience over the last few years of seeing what life is like, not only in Beijing, but in many other parts of China. And it's a good life. And I think if American people knew what life was like here, they would enjoy it. To a, I mean, they, they would have a lot of respect for that kind of lifestyle. So I, I would say that this kind of, um, I, but on the other hand, I do see a lot of sort of preachy press. And if we could avoid that, it's, not, it's never going to convince anybody unless they believe you to start with. Okay, thank you. Um, let's move to the next speaker. Um, Mario, please. Thank you, Mabel. Yeah, Jun Mai covered this point uh, very, 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 very well, along with Philip, th th this idea that you know, we, we don't see enough empathy uh, in, in Chinese media. There's very much an important need beyond what I talked about. I was talking about the puzzle of, of some strategies, you know, strategic response uh, against some specific case examples that we're all quite familiar with. But in addition to that, there's the, the, the softer issue. You, the softer issue is, yeah, uh, th there's a, a lack of feel, a lack of ganjue and, and empathy uh, in the response from the Chinese media. And I'm not blaming Chinese media specifically when I say that, but I am going to point the finger at the cultural differences. I mean, huge difference because of the language differences, for example. Um, in either case, um, this still leads us to the, the piece of the puzzle that I was putting together strategically, which says we need to respond in a way that's clear, but also with information that is demonstrably and observably certain, information that is apodictic, information that is not assertoric or rhetorical, which is what they do. So you can't do that in return. And it means, of course, that that across all Chinese media and ministerial communications and ambassadors and wolf warrior this and that, uh, there has to be an avoidance of snide, sneering, tit-for-tat type remarks. Again, instead, focus in on what's demonstrably, observably certain and known to be true. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dong Jiao Shou. So, Professor Dong, the floor is yours. I think I have summarized some of the problems that I think, or some of the treatments but I think all of these scholars has provided me shed some light on my way of thinking. I think there are several different keywords. I think it's to rebalance the different powers and the story. And I think the Western media and Chinese media needs to balance our emotions, balance the economic development. I think that there is going to be balance between the common stories and also between the unique stories. If the storytellers used to use the microscope to find each other's shortcoming, we should reflect upon ourselves. We should also find a common ground. 
And I think we should also figure out the complexity and also the simplicity in China. We should tell the very complicated story of China. And the third problem is about the balance between the grand stories and also the small stories. We are willing to add some of the personal story in the grand storytelling of China. China has been presented to the world with the huge mega project, huge mega uh, more ways and something like that. But we need to figure out the simplicities inside of it. And the fourth part is that we should balance between the civil voices with the political voices. And this is also going to switch people's mindset. And some people are being founded or kidnapped by their emotions, something that they are not very reasonable. We should also balance the Western world with the uh, Chinese word. The Western world is not only limited to the United States, and uh, the sixth part is that we should balance the improvements, and uh, we should also tell the shortcoming of China. And the sixth part is that we should find a balance between the wholesale and the retail, and we should not use one story to be told in every single corner of the world. And the sixth. And the final part is that we should combine the new knowledge together with the old consensus. And we are going to continue to uh, tell the world the newly development of China. And we should also contribute our fair shares with the kindness. You have mentioned about the balances. And it is going to be multilingual and multilayer. I think one thing impresses me most is about the balance of wholesale and retail. The story is not going to be one to be told in every corner across the world. Madam Ji Hongbo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, General Secretary Wang Miao. I think that finally I have two points to make. The one is that the Chinese national image is multiple is also very diversified. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs is also representing the Chinese way of storytelling. We have so many companies go through the international arenas. We have so many Chinese students, Chinese tourists. They are representing different aspects of the Chinese images. Traditional speaking, in terms of the international promotions, we do not do a very good job. So I do agree with Professor Dong's idea. We should enhance our capacities and improve the awareness. You have done a lot of training courses, and we should continue to promote the Chinese image through the training courses. And this is actually representing the Chinese capacity. The second part is to generate the consensus. So many companies, when they are going abroad, they are actually trying to contribute to the local economy, to the world economy. But sometimes, when they arrive here, they start to do the project immediately. They finish building the port bridge. They finish building the uh, power stations. And they did not talk to the community, the local community. And they return back. So the company don't have much experience to talk to the local community. So the company sometimes needs to be relying on the power of the media. And sometimes we are also working together with some of the civil organizations in China who actually goes to other different uh, projects in other different countries and spread the image of China. I believe the company can borrow the power of the NGOs to have a better communication with the local community. Thank you very much. Mr. Huang Renwei. There is an old saying uh, that is, uh, seeing is believing. And so many uh, foreign uh, friends living in China, and uh, they understand China better than their mother countries, uh, and uh, they can understand uh, what happened in China. And they tell the Chinese story to their mother country. I think they, their words is more believable than our official media. And also, seeing is believing. That means many Chinese people, Chinese people are going out, and they find many, find many things abroad different from what they educated in Chinese school. So they also need to be re-educated 
when they go out. Uh, when we are working in the Belt and the Road country, and we find we cannot understand the many cultural, social, and uh, political elements in these countries. And uh, uh, now China is becoming more powerful, and uh, people don't think you Chinese people uh, respect, respect others so uh, like before. Uh, many Chinese be self-proud and uh, uh, sometimes even elegant. So I, I think uh, we should be careful. Uh, uh, we should treat our foreign friends uh, more friendly and uh, more modest for, from the Chinese side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Huang Renwei. Thank you very much. I've heard so many pearls of wisdom in the last hour that I don't know how I can add to them, but I would just say that human stories are very important because they deal with the biggest enemy, which is ignorance, and ignorance is, full, is fueled by unconscious bias. And the best story is what China is contributing to the world. I think, as has just been said, if the story is told by foreigners who actually understand and have seen how China actually works, it is very powerful. But what is even more powerful is when that is a group of foreigners with Chinese people peppered amongst them. How many times have we seen a group of nations discussing China without a Chinese person in the room? So that, to me, is extremely uh, important. And I think that working together is going to be um, the future in many ways. Certainly in my area, diversity completely trumps a single monocultural effort. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Mai Jin, Mr. Mai Jin. Uh, thank you. Uh, since we're talking about very tough uh, issue today, and it's actually a uh, a lot of restrictions are very uh, structural, and I hope you guys don't mind me being a little bit creative in my uh, suggestions. Um, so as we all know that um, the, the, the power of telling uh, China stories are mostly in the hands of, uh, let's say, foreign correspondents based in China. Um, and, but uh, maybe people outside of my industry will probably know less about the, there's also a huge group of uh, Chinese nationals uh, employed in this uh, uh, foreign organization, uh, uh, international news organizations uh, who are called the Chinese assistants or Chinese secretaries. Uh, in Chinese, that would be Zhongfang uh, Mishu or Zhong Mi. Um, they're called that way not because they're not professional journalists, but it's just, uh, and quite the opposite, they're also usually very well-educated, well-trained, have very proficient foreign, language, uh, foreign languages, and they know the readers overseas very well. And uh, also, very importantly, they have a lot of knowledge about China. Um, they not only uh, witness China's economic miracle through the numbers, they live through it. Um, they have more friends, say, in the Chinese government, or they have more friends, say, relatives who are still peasants in China, uh, in China. so they know different layers of China. But very unfortunately, the system, um, you know, designed by the regulators over here, uh, sort of makes them, um, uh, like, uh, gives them less protection and gives them less access uh, compared to their uh, non-China, uh, non-Chinese colleague. And uh, the result is that they have, uh, they have very little say about how to tell China stories in these uh, major uh, international uh, news organizations. And it's actually quite unique in China and because you don't need to look any further than uh, Korea, Japan, Pakistan, that you see a lot of uh, nationals of their own being employed, telling their own stories as correspondents and in, sometimes, in some cases as bureau chiefs. So I guess if, uh, if uh, these Chinese nationals are by default second-class uh, citizens in these uh, uh, international news organizations that they work in. Uh, it's, it's, it's taking away the influence of uh, people who probably move, hold a more gradualist view or understands better about China's nuances. And it is actually giving more oxygen to what is usually referred to here as Western media bias. Thank you. Thank you. Let me say, represent up in two sentences. 
The first way, telling a good story should let the professional do the professional things. The second way is to tell a good Chinese story. We are going to use the people with the kindness to tell the story with the kindness. Press a one way, the floor is yours. I also have two points to make. No matter how the narrative is going to be, the multiple storytelling is going to be very important. If a story is lacking the internal flexibilities, lacking the internal pressure, it is not going to be very convincing. We need more space to let the voices to be presented. The second party that I want to tell a very good story, very small story. We have tell about how to convince other people. So if you want to convince other people, you should believe it by yourself. A few years ago, I used to work in Uganda. I've been talking with African scholars about the Belt Road Initiative, and he asked me three questions. I am going to repeat the three questions here. The first one that the Western media has criticized China for the Chinese way of doing things, but actually, China has not entered into China for the long, entered into Africa. Right now, China has been entered into Africa for 1960s. It's just like the nationalisms of the vaccines. So how will China convince the non-Westerners that what China is, is doing is not of the personal interest? The second question is that the work of the Chinese infrastructure constructions. In the past 20 to 30 years, China is actually surpassing what the Western world have done for 200 to 300 years. The Western criticism is groundless. But in Africa, after so many things to be done, people don't understand the reason behind it. It is not very convincing. It's not about voices. It is also about the long-term value sharing. How do we build a long-term value sharing? It is not about the power of the language. It is actually the power of values. Thank you very much. Professor Wang Yiwei. I have three suggestions for China, three suggestions for the Western world. The first one is that the shared destiny for the humankind. Chinese people always emphasize that uh, I should be a part of you, but actually Chinese don't care about you should be a part of me. So why don't we talk about the good story about the Western world? Second. We need to uh, do we do too much about uh, express China. We talk less about others. The multi god, uh, the, this kind of uh, they feel frightened looking at China. We need to uh, understand the fear of the religion, uh, religious civilization. China's movie or novel. Are talking about uh, China, but China should take uh, take a movie about other countries. Uh, number three, uh, less uh, big story, but uh, more uh, small stories or vivid stories. Uh, for Western countries, three suggestions. First, uh, more history, less politics. China is an ancient, civilized country. You need to understand China from 5,000 years. Uh, Ch Communist Party have 100 years. Marxism coming to China. Uh, they, they have been Chinese, become Chinese. Second, uh, less Western, more Chinese. Uh, they often take Western as a reference. Uh, so, uh, uh, the uh, empire dissolved. There has to be a multinational country like Tibet, like uh, Uyghur, Xinjiang Uyghur. It's not like that. It's dissolving China into many nation countries. No. Number three, the without me and with me relation, the Western media should uh, think less of themselves to share more common view about other. Western countries are self-centered. Uh, they want too much about their the similarity. China and the West, there are not that much difference for humankind. If we look 
at the Earth from Moon, from the universe. Uh, we are the same human being. Uh, the uh, journalists should tell more about the similarity and talk less about uh, the difference. I think this is a wonderful uh, session round table. I received a lot of information. Looking forward to this uh, session panel. This topic is a hot topic. Our CCG, uh, we want to build a Chinese narrative, how to make good uh, stories. The Western kind of whole world can understand China. Forty years before Mokni we uh, uh, get close to the world to, uh, for 40 years. We need to talk about the China solution to the global challenge, global solution of China's problem. We use Chinese wisdom to contribute to the world. Some scholars made very good points. They talk about several balances, diversification, complication, simplicity, and uniqueness, how we can combine all of them together. This is a process of going up and going down. Sometimes we may be overdo, uh, may overdo some, but we need a balance. If we want to uh, uh, do a good job for placing China's balance in the global situation, uh, complication, simplicity, uh, we can tell a good Chinese story. Thank you very much for approaching this issue from different perspective. I hope it's an open question for a, gr uh, a great risk for a people, for a Chinese system, for a civilization system. Uh, understanding tolerance, uh, coexistence will be great, significant for the global peace. All the people who pay attention to CCG for globalization, this uh, common topic is more than China's narrative. It's about globalization, it's about the merging. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much.
office as well as uh, our industry uh, chambers. So MMC have been in China for the last uh, 40 years. I look at China economy has been growing uh, really well in the last 40 years according to the uh, survey of the Ministry of uh, Commerce last year. There are roughly around 1 million uh, foreign invest enterprises here in China. So I'm sure from uh, this panel, you probably will hear what are some stories, what are some vision, what are some insight for foreign invest uh, multinationals here in China, what the role they are playing, what are things they see in the next couple of years. Without any further ado, I would uh, like to quickly go through the uh, uh, esteemed uh, list of uh, panelists, uh, we have uh, Mr. Von Barber, Global Chairman, KPMG Global China Practice. We have uh, Tony Chen, VP uh, Yapei, Zhongguo, the uh, Core Diagnostics. We have uh, Nick Koi, CEO of uh, Australian China Chamber of Commerce. We have uh, Len Yan, CCG Senior Council Member, Executive Vice President of uh, Daimler China. We have uh, Julian McCormack, Chairman of uh, British Chamber of uh, Commerce in China. We have uh, Martin Muller, Chairman of uh, Swiss China Chamber of Commerce. We have uh, Xuan Peng, CCG Senior Council Member, General Manager of uh, Public Affairs, Ningying, China. We have uh, Xu Baoping, CCG Senior Council Member, Chairman of the Board of the Director of uh, Color Asia Pacific Holding. We have uh, Jiu Zhou, the President of uh, Disman, China. So, as I said earlier, MMC has uh, made uh, some important uh, contribution in China. But uh, probably in the uh, last couple of years, you have hear uh, different uh, voices or different opinion. But uh, this is an opportunity to listen to these uh, industry leaders. What are some, you know, insight? What are some authentic pictures reflecting in the respective industry? Maybe without any further ado, let me start with the barber. And uh, you maybe can talk about what's your insight about multinationals, uh, what, how, what they do, how is going on in China. And thank you to CCG for inviting me to participate uh, in this important event today. And the topic, of course, is really important, uh, innovation. But stepping back, I think it's helpful to remind ourselves what innovation is. The way I think about it in a business context is that innovation is either doing the same things in a new way, so a new process, or doing new things, creating a new product or service. And technology is what you might use to deliver that innovation, either by finding new application for existing technologies or developing new technologies. And that's what they call technological innovation. And as we know from our daily lives here in China, technological disruption has already become a new normal. The adage, innovate or die, or if you don't change, you can become extinct, is extremely relevant in the China market. So while I'm really positive about the opportunities during the 14th five-year plan period, to be successful in converting those opportunities, MNCs, will need to be highly agile and innovate at China speed, always with the overarching goal of adapting and aligning their value proposition and business strategies with China's economic and social development priorities and goals in the five-year plan. And when you think that for many sectors, like the auto sector, the size of the market in China means that MNCs can't be global leaders, without being successful in China. So that means that MNCs will need to participate in innovative development in China to stay competitive here, but also in other markets around the world, with China offering scale, cost, and speed advantages for developing and commercializing new technologies and business models. 
So turning, turning to the next part of your question, international cooperation to support China's transition to a green, low-carbon economy is a key area that a lot of MNCs and foreign investors are looking at now. Efforts to develop the green economy here in China will increase demand for green equipment, technology, services, and of course, financing and investment. And they're all areas where MNCs can share their experience of developing and implementing new approaches and technologies to reduce the impact, uh, the climate impact in particular, of economic and social activity. As I said before, for foreign suppliers, the market here offers scale, cost, and speed advantages. And that successful experience here can also be exported to um, and, and replicated in other countries. The last point that I'd like to make is that there's a growing expectation, if not, maybe if I wrote this a couple of months ago, I'd say optimism, but an expectation that ecological interdependence will give rise to international cooperation in climate change. Much has been said about the potential for and the necessity of collaboration between China and US to combat climate change. But I think there's also going to be considerable synergies from cooperation between China and the UK, for example. Indeed, I think it's hard to imagine the UK could achieve the ambitious goals which, which the government outlined uh, in its plan for a green industrial revolution without cooperating with Chinese companies. And I'm sure similar synergies exist and will exist in other advanced economies, including to partner in helping developing economies to tackle climate change. So given that the development, deployment, and use of clean technologies will be key to addressing climate change, a key point here is I think we need to guard against balkanization of these technologies and ecosystems because access to a bigger market, which the globalization of climate technologies and solutions would provide, would be expected to support more and earlier private investment in innovation. At the same time though, the way that these technologies are developed, deployed and used will also need to be responsive to host country expectations about building local industries and creating local employment rather than only striving to deliver low cost production. And we saw these themes through various policy announcements in the UK last year and also in President Biden's address to a joint session of Congress in April this year, when he said, jobs, 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 talking about the importance of creating local employment. In closing, I'm hopeful that international cooperation in tackling climate change will usher a new round of foreign investment in China and more green partnerships between foreign companies and Chinese companies, both in China and in developed and developing countries around the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. I look at during the uh, turbulent time, the uh, technology is a good lever to create a synergy among different countries, right? That's a great insight. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite Chen Jianzhong, Ya Pei Zhen Duan, Quan Qiu, the Fu Zong Cai, the Abbott uh, Global Core Diagnostic is a market leader. So I would like to invite Tony to share with us Abbott's efforts in the health industry. Tony, please. Uh, thank you for your introduction. I want to thank CCG for your introduction. I'm very honored to attend today's meeting. Uh, the topic is uh, corporate uh, innovation. Uh, and uh, the new develop a new pattern. Please allow me to introduce about. We are a company with 130 years history. Actually, we have been focusing on innovation technology by providing service and uh, product. We create a future for healthcare. We want to help people of all ages to enjoy long and wonderful life. 
This is a uh, innovative DNA that Abbott has. That's why Abbott, in 2020, has won the title of a company changing the world. That is acknowledgement of Abbott for making the contribution. Talking about Abbott's growth past, it is actually is a path for Abbott's innovation about the corporate innovation and the, the new development, new pattern. My understanding is we need to be objective about the new development pattern and uh, its relationship with innovation. China wants to build a uh, dual circling system with domestic circulation as the main and uh, external uh, circulation as a supplement. We have to understand the significance of this dual circulation. We want to break the uh, breaking point, pain point from production to consumption. So Chinese companies with their innovation can overcome the core technology. It is not only for the tomorrow's development company, but for China to build a safe and stable supply chain and to build a safe and a domestic uh, circulation. It can also help China to acquire the right of speech in the international community. Uh, I'm going to talk about how to help company to become an innovative company. If for new challenges, for new problems, uh, individual cannot succeed, we need to find partnership to have a role of one plus one more than two. Uh, we are uh, initiate a uh, project, a demo by diagnostic technology combined with clinical solution. We can provide an integrated solution. For the next two years, we can set, establish the demo center, the agile smart laboratory to become to come into true being to promote the growth of diagnostic and clinical medicine. Innovation is for future. So globally, we are facing the uh, fight against the coronavirus. We need to think about how to defend a new uh, types of pandemic in March, we established a, a epidemic department. Global leaders for future pandemics be prepared for public health cooperation networking, global resources. We hope in future for the future possible pandemic, we can be better prepared. In the end, Abbott, we are going to uphold the innovation DNA to do more R&D, to work with the local players. We hope to create a better future for Chinese people. We will rooted in, be rooted in China's market to provide a better support for Health China 2030. We hope that working with powers of the industry, we can uh, satisfy the uh, health demand of the Chinese people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. Actually, for the due circulation and the innovation, each uh, multinational MNC, they have different ideas. As a leading uh, uh, health company, how to take the opportunity of the due circulation it will be critical for your strategic positioning in China. On uh, Nick, because uh, the uh, I look at the last one year, the uh, Australian-China relationship has been a bit uh, unstable, and uh, I don't know how this uh, political the changes or implication have an impact on the business, especially for those. Uh, Australian companies, how they do, how they see their future here in China, 
and uh, what's your uh, insight, you know, for next uh, uh, one year or so, how things can be stabilized? Nick, floor is yours. Wow. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for the question. Um, that's uh, a, a tricky one. Um, of course, uh, in the context of the, the relationship, the business sectors had its concerns, and uh, um, but I guess what I'm, what I'm here to chat about today is how Australia and China can work together, uh, particularly in the context of the green carbon economy, innovation, uh, and those sorts of areas. And, and really what we hope going forward is that there's a solid period of stability for, for business to build on uh, and develop in the future. So, I mean, what I thought I'd touch on in the context of your question was a few uh, examples, some that you probably have never heard of about where we're seeing uh, quite a lot of particularly interesting collaboration on innovation between uh, Australia and China. So I'll, I'll pop out a couple of examples and then I'll, I'll sort of finish with, a, I guess, a few recommendations uh, and observations that can be interpreted fairly broadly, not just in the context of, of, of China, Australia and how we can work together on innovation, but um, many people probably wouldn't know that with China's development of its uh, COMAX C919 uh, aircraft that uh, uh, there's been a collaboration uh, back in Australia with Monash University and a professor Wu Xinhua on, uh, on uh, manufacturing uh, using 3D printing engine parts. Uh, and in fact, Professor Wu working at Monash University uh, was the first guy to uh, to completely manufacture a jet engine using 3D printing. All right, and there's a, a terrific example of collaboration between an Australian institution, Australian university and innovation here over in China. Um, and then on the back of that, some of those 3D technologies we used in collaboration with Monash, uh, Guangzhou's uh, Southern Medical University and the Prince Alfred uh, Hospital in Melbourne to uh, use 3D printing to assist cancer patients. Right, and these are the sorts of innovations that are happening all the time, absent, uh, you know, that, that a lot of us just don't know about, right? Um, and so there is uh, a tremendous amount of collaboration that is happening behind the scenes. Uh, and so from a business context, whilst we acknowledge the difficulties the bilateral relationship has been going through. What's really important is that us as business leaders get on with working together, working collaboratively uh, with our, our counterparts over here in China. Uh, that's what we're seeing with our universities. That's what we're seeing with our businesses as they're moving forward in uh, working together where it makes sense to do so. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll finish, Mike, by just running through a few observations, if you like, by how we can uh, further enhance uh, the ability to work together uh, in innovation uh, in the context of, as I said, that not only China Australia uh, capacity to work together, but I think this applies to everybody. And that's we really need to strengthen the international links between uh, research institutes, universities. I think this is tremendously important and something that if anything, has probably gone backwards a bit recently, right? Um, and we really also need to ensure that IP protection and international transfers uh, of technology is, 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 is done well and that people can feel secure in the context of those collaborations, that those protections are in place. Um, you know, I think we need to also look at developing more open source platforms to share information. I think that's, you know, particularly important uh, and lastly, um, I think what's also going to be key going forward is reducing uh, barriers, and this is particularly important to government around the world, but reducing barriers uh, for technological collaboration and innovation between countries, between companies, between universities. So uh, we certainly don't want to see things regress where we're seeing more barriers put up to collaboration and innovation. We want to see less going forward. Um, and uh, Mike, I appreciate the opportunity of coming here and talking to everyone today. And we look forward to a bright future. 
Thanks, Nick. I, I look at the reading is, uh, you know, even during the uh, turbulent time, let's go back to the basics. Let's work with the uh, research institute and the university to, to focus on some specific development, yeah, get things done. That's a great insight. Next. Actually, in the past 40 years of reform and opening up in China, we could see one major change is the auto industry. It has been swifted from a one of the major giants in the bicycles. We became a kingdom of the automobiles. The multinationals has contributed a lot. Today, we are really honored to invite Mr. Long Yan the Vice President of Daimler Greater China Region to share with us in the past 40 years the growth history of Daimler. And we also want to learn from Mr. Leung Yens and also Daimler's confusion and how will the Daimler to deal with the Chinese market moving forward? What kind of direction are the multinationals goes into? And many thanks to CCG to offer this opportunity for to, to Daimler that we can share some experiences here in this round. Uh, I'm, I'm going to speak in Chinese. Daimler Mercedes is actually a foreign brand in China. And starting from the year 2005, we have built a joint venture. What is as we, what we call BIAC. We are the winners and the participants and benefiter of the reform and opening up in China. We call ourselves a multinational deeply rooted in China. For this time, the Henan province has suffered from the floods. Mercedes-Benz and also is working together with our dealerships and the partners. On the 21st of July, we have donated 10 million RMBs and we have donated this supplies to let the Hunan province to recover from their disaster. Speaking of the topic today, I think for the interest of time, I only have three points to make. The first one in the Chinese market and also Chinese importance to the international automobile industry. The second part is the new strategies of the Daimler company and also our practice in innovation. I'm going to speak very fast. Chinese contribution to the auto industry, internationally speaking, can be seen as two perspectives. The first one is that China is a very huge market. Although China was affected by the COVID-19 pandemic last year, it has also cut the first momentum in the world. In 2021, across the country, the total sales number, passenger vehicle, is actually 25 million units. That is only 1.9% drop from the year 2019. We really want to thank the local government's support for the prevention and control of COVID-19. After June last year, the whole market has been pulled back, and we have eliminated the, uh, the effect of COVID-19, and we have demonstrated a very good endogenous growth dynamics, especially for the luxury cars. Mercedes it belongs to the luxury cars. Last year, our sales number is reaching 70, uh, 7.4 units. That is 11.9% growth, and we are occupying 36% growth in the global market. In the first half of this year, we have delivered 441,000 units of the vehicle. So I'm always, I'm actually talk, talk about the capacities in the Chinese market, but I could see that for another part in the vehicle auto industry, NE waste, one major direction. I, I think China is also leading in the global market. In the first half of this year, the total sales number in China, the auto industry in China, domestically speaking, it is actually reaching 1.26 million units. That is two times growth. And while the penetration ratio in the market is actually around 10%, this is a very, very remarkable number. Daimler has shifted our global strategy last week. Our company has officially launched. Let me put it simply. In the year 2030, if the condition allowed, we are going to achieve a pure and all-rounded electronic vehicles. To put it simply, 
we used to focus on the electrics first, and we used to think about electric only by the year 2030. This is something we should think about. The transitional period for the global auto industry this year marks the EQ year for the Mercedes-Benz, and we are going to come up with three different types of the EVs, EQ A and EQ B, and also e imported EQS. Second, and the third part, the strategies and innovations for the Daimler, the company, our practice to innovations. We think that innovations during the 45-year period it is going to be one major focus in the coming five years. The innovation is going to help us with the intellectual connected vehicles. In the August this year, the Daimler's Global Research Center is going to uh, welcome its first bunch of the researchers and it is going to be the home for 1,000 different researchers. It's going to be the top four major R&D centers, and we have invested 1.1 billion RMBs. And this is demonstrating the Daimler's deep commitment to the market. We believe that through the ever more importance of the innovation, the local innovation is going to become very important, and it's also going to be a very promising factor for the new energy vehicles in China. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Long. I think Mr. Long has given us a very insightful speech. I have learned uh, three major points. The company's growth should be correlated to the local community, and uh, it should be a question for the social responsibilities. And Daimler is playing a very important role in the progress. And second part, the new technologies, new innovations, is going to be the development for the future development. It is also going to be the major driver for the future development. This year, in Yizhuang, we are going to become one of the four major industry pillars in the world. And it's actually reflecting the true work. And I think that it is going to continue. We are going to continue so, our momentum. Uh, Last week, Mac, uh, Julian uh, McCormack, we have been both invited to Tianjin to witness the uh, delivery of the first wide-body Airbus A350. Right. So I look at that was uh, very exciting. You know, we we can feel it. So you, as a chairman for the uh, uh, British Chamber of Commerce in China, I would like to hear you know, how you uh, look at the China market, what the symptoms you have heard from your members, and uh, what are some challenges or some uh, growth levers for you uh, members in the next uh, you know, uh, couple years. Thank you. And thank you to CCG for the invitation to come and speak here today. And yes, and thank you, Mike. Last week was a good day for aviation, uh, and we were very pleased with uh, uh, the delivery of that aircraft. Um, I thought I'll share a few thoughts uh, and ideas uh, on this topic. Uh, we're talking about innovation strategy today. Uh, that's the subject of this panel. And I think first, it is worth thinking a little bit about growth and factors of production. So resources, capital, labor, competition and enterprise, and productivity. And future growth depends on enhanced productivity. And that, of course, is driven by innovation. And undermining that, or underpinning that, is talent, people. Uh, and in the digital world, increasingly information and data. As we heard in the last session, data is the fuel of innovation. For innovation to flourish, the flow of talent and data is as crucial as the flow of goods. And here, I think the landscape is changing. For companies to invest and commit resources to research and development, they must feel optimistic about the business outlook. The British Chamber of Commerce survey annually of business confidence shows that whilst opinion remains high, very high, it has declined over the past three years. And equally, 
the number of companies planning to increase investment, again, whilst it remains high, has gone down. It's not possible to say at this stage whether this is a result of COVID and recent tensions in China's international relations or whether there are other factors, but it is a concerning trend. When we look at the number of foreign nationals in Beijing and Shanghai, that trend is clear. Numbers have halved over the past 10 years in Beijing from 110,000 to 63,000. And in Shanghai, from 210,000 to 163,000. Now, COVID have, has, of course, exacerbated this, but uh, numbers in those cities have declined. And I think it's worth highlighting that the exchange of people is important for so many reasons in this context, not least to ensure diversity of ideas, diversity of thought, experience, capability, and know-how. These are all the enablers of innovation, and that flow of knowledge and people is so important. On data, China is rightly taking measures to protect personal data and manage the flows of critical and sensitive information. Every country uh, is responsible and is doing that. This is important to ensure safe and secure management of information and is something, of course, all countries do. But laws and regulations create uncertainty. Interpretation is uncertain. And we see companies faced with new compliance concerns. What data is important? What information can be exported or needs a license to export? So these are concerns for companies. And a concern, therefore, is that whilst China's intention is to coordinate domestic development with deeper integration into the global economy, the flow of people and data across borders may be slowing. That has implications. Implications for China's innovation ambitions and for the inter international companies that invest and develop ideas, new services and products here. China is set to continue proactively to open up to the world. Foreign companies, companies that bring investment and know-how and who develop new capability in China need confidence that the people and information that are needed to innovate can flow freely between the domestic and international markets that make up the dual, circle, uh, dual circulation economy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julian, for highlighting. I look at this, uh, the innovation model has been really something new. I look at the, as China is promoting the uh, domestic innovation champion, as well as how to can align with the uh, international, you know, multinational uh, engagement model, and how both sides can learn from each other. I would say those uh, practice or trying can be a good learning from both sides, and then we can achieve the uh, collaboration, right? Thank you for sharing this uh, great insight. Next, I would like to uh, invite uh, a next speaker, uh, Martin Muller, Chairman of uh, Swiss China Chinese Chamber of Commerce. We know Winter Olympics is coming up, right? So, Martin, I know you have been really busy coming up to the, uh, from the uh, warm, hot Shenzhen to Beijing. And uh, I, I know the uh, Swedish company have been playing some roles in the, this, uh, you know, Winter Olympics. Can you share your insight, uh, your members, how they see Winter Olympics, how they see their business potential here in China? Thank you, Mike. Uh, that's a surprising twist of the topic. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Generally speaking, uh, you know, the, the process started a long time ago. Um, the, the design uh, of, the <clears throat> of the area where all the competitions will happen is mainly made by Swiss specialists in cooperation with Chinese specialists, of course. So everybody is very excited and is looking forward to open a new market segment a very traditional market segment in Switzerland. And they see a big chance to grow this now, also in China in the future. 
May I come back to the main topic quickly? Um, my organization represents the Sino-Swiss business community here in China. So I will reflect on our main topic from a Swiss point of view. Uh, let me start with a few numbers. Switzerland is among the top 20 import trading partners of China. About 900 Swiss companies are active here, covering 18 different market sectors. The two biggest shares are machinery and electronic manufacturing. These two combined represent about 45% of the Swiss entities here in China. So we have conducted the research among these companies related to the recent situation and their expectations slash strategies for the next five year plan period. Here are a few of the main findings. <clears throat> Uh, first, China, a market in transition. Uh, my colleague told, uh, mentioned this already. Also, this is true for Swiss. Swiss and German machine builders encounter a complex economic and political area of tension in China. On the one hand, the large Chinese market is and was an important anchor in the COVID-19 crisis. On the other hand, geopolitical tensions, Chinese industrial policy, and the rigid pan pandemic response complicate business. Uh, then we have made in China uh, growing competitive, competitive pressure uh, to, for Swiss and German companies, machine builders, but almost a third of Swiss and German machine builders see made in China positive for their business. Uh, this is due to the fact that the strategy promotes the modernization of the industry and the demand for intelligent manufacturing. Uh, then we have dual circulation, which is a core strategy of the five-year plan, aims to increase domestic demand through more household consumption. Another important goal is to strengthen China's economic independence and resilience to uncertain global market. Nevertheless, dual circulation continues to attach great importance to international trade, and this is also seen very positive. <clears throat> so I jump a bit. The last point I want to mention is uh, geopolitics and decoupling. About 30% of Swiss companies and almost Half of German mechanical engineering companies say that they have been affected by the economic conflict between China and the US, mostly from punitive tariffs, delivery difficulties due to disruptions, and the supply chain and delivery restrictions to Chinese customers. Let me close with two requests. The topic of this session is how to foster global collaboration. We have two burning issues that need to be addressed urgently. The first one, foreigners entry to China. I'll, Mike mentioned it, I live in Guangdong and all of you know that some weeks ago we had some COVID cases. <clears throat> the response from the authorities to this crisis was absolutely impressive. Within days they rolled out a uh, out measures so that in this highly dense area, every person got tested every second day. Now let me ask, wouldn't it be possible to roll out a similar, very safe arrangement for foreigners who wish to enter China? <clears throat> People would be willing to pay the cost and comply with the said safety measures, but so far, many of them simply don't have the chance to come to China. Uh, some of the managers or specialists have been trying for one and, a one and a half years without success. Last point, I call it containing the hate virus. Every day I read news of various countries among the world and what I sometimes find there makes my blood run cold. Besides containing the COVID-19 virus, governments and organizations must now pay attention on containing the spread of the hate virus. We must jointly build and strengthen cooperation and contain those ill-minded hawks who are working through various ways to lay fire, foster protectionism, and disrupt 
the development of a healthy global economic system. If we don't succeed, many people on the globe will suffer once again. Therefore, I would like to express a big thank you to CCG for organizing this event, which brings together leaders from many countries and helps to have an open exchange. Thanks, Martin. Thank you. See, I, I look at the uh, one of uh, concern you just request is that uh, you know, having multinationals, uh, you know, growing and s settling in China, also we need to have a different dimension to encourage foreigners how to, you know, live comfortably in Chinese environment, especially when have these uh, COVID cases, traveling restriction, mobility, all these things. Like uh, previously, Nenzhu also talked about the, uh, uh, some policy, how we can have some tax incentives for international talents to be able to uh, live in China at the similar uh, life, I was saying, the uh, uh, living standards yeah, compared to other countries that will be very crucial, right? So, thanks, Martin. I think that's also very good leading. The next speaker will be. Uh, we just talk about uh, the uh, development, uh, human resources, and the policies. Next, uh, I would like to invite Mr. Shui Peng, uh, the CCG senior. Council Member General uh, Manager of Public Affairs uh, LinkedIn, LinkedIn China. LinkedIn China has many experience in human uh, resources. Now I would like to invite Shui Peng to share with us what is your view about the uh, HR development, local talents, international talents, especially the, uh, the due uh, circulation consequences. Uh, my name is Shui Peng. Today, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to share with you. LinkedIn is the largest uh, uh, professional platform, developer of platform. We are an internet company. We like to look at data. Today, uh, we are talking about uh, the innovation strategy for to foster strong global co uh, collaboration in China's new development plan. Due circulation against the complex international situation and uh, COVID-19, uh, all of them are posing challenges for the, the existence of the company. For LinkedIn, we have two lines, uh, LinkedIn talent solution, we have another line called the market solution, our marketing solution. At the beginning of the uh, pandemic, after a initial pain, our marketing plan grew fast. It showed directly that under the new situation, how people change from offline to online, from conventional marketing to the new uh, marketing model, over the past few months, China companies, their sales online in, uh, grow in terms of quantity, and it there is a change from the past uh, low cost, uh, large quantity to high quality. We need to see that the growth of the SMCs is even more dynamic. The sales based on internet is more than product. Uh, there are services as well, APP, uh, the game applications, gaming applications, the growth is very impressive among all the other peers. So I think the pandemic has changed pe how people live and uh, produce. There are a lot of challenges as well. For example, brand recognition, brand reputation, there is uh, no way for market to trans uh, we hope our platform can help to address this issue. Human resources, that's one of the two lines of our company. There are changes as well. 
uh, after pandemic, the company demanding international talents. Their demand is growing instead of shrinking. We co we propose a anti circulation uh, cycle uh, hiring uh, plan. Because of the pandemic, uh, some companies may lay off people. Uh, but if you have other ideas, you may be able easier to get uh, talents. Uh, two thirds of the companies are making the talents plan planning. Our companies are going out and going into other countries. I raise two examples. Our overseas uh, hiring, uh, we have much more share of foreign employees. We local we. Uh, employ local talents. Another dimension is we used to in, uh, uh, hire, employ uh, more uh, management po uh, positions like the local group leaders and uh, managers. But lately, we have more demand for uh, talent people, uh, technologies people. That means our companies are placing R and D marketing to other countries to get close to the demand of local markets. The companies have a lot of challenges as well, like the employer's brand is not strong enough to attract the top-notch uh, HR. With uh, complex uh, uh, issues, it do not know how to def uh, tell whether we are to uh, recognize the talents we use, uh, then we can use our LinkedIn solution to help them address the issue. We have a con uh, concept, LinkedIn's economic graph. The concept is we can combine HR and uh, other elements of the economy. We can describe a clear roadmap for economy. Today, we talk about innovation. We have been working on economic graph for four to five years, but we still hope with future innovation, it can get, in, get closer to economic activities and bring uh, develop momentum to companies. Thank you, Mr. Xue Peng. An important point is data speaks itself in for the with so many changes, a lot of foreign uh, experts, uh, foreign uh, human resources, be it in China and other countries, we are getting close to the host market. There are ruins and the and the winds outside, but the business grows fast. Thank you, Shui Peng. Next, uh, all the foreign medias, when they talk about China, uh, good uh, name card is China's high speed rail and China subways. Today, we are very happy to invite Mr. Xu. Uh, the, uh, Mr. Xu is the very uh, HTC, uh, uh, who is the uh, Nor Bramser Asia Pacific Chairman of Board Directors. Actually, this company is the invisible champion of the industry of high-speed rail and uh, railways. As an uh, invisible champion, how you play your role? Thank you, Mr. Liu. Thank you, CCG, for inviting me to be here. This is my first presence here to attend this uh, uh, think tank brainstorming. Today, we talk about uh, the uh, corporate uh, innovation strategy in China's new development plan. All the, ac the experts are the uh, uh, multinational companies in the new development plan. Today, I want to make a simple sharing. Our experience is uh, multinationals under the new development plan in China n need to do in-depth innovation. This is the reason why multinational companies can continue their development in China. And it is the reason uh, how China can in 
deepen its innovation and uh, cross-border uh, uh, cooperation. I want to share with you some of my company experience and our consideration for the future. Uh, talking about our corner brands, uh, you may not hear about our company, but I can tell you proudly that you can feel a lot of our company because we are a company of 116 years old, uh, headquartered in Munich. We have two core products. One is for real production. Uh, uh, subway uh, and uh, uh, high speed rail, the uh, all the uh, trucks, passenger cars, the control system. Uh, our products is uh, just for braking. Our core product is a braking system. Bremser uh, is the uh, German word in English is brake, braking system. We all know that uh, all the transportation vehicles for human, for goods, be it the trucks or rail trains, the most difficult part is not how fast we can go. If we want to make it fast, 600 kilometers is easy, 450 kilometers is no problem. The biggest challenge is we can. Uh, uh, stop it uh, within a certain period of time. It's related to everybody's uh, life. Common brands uh, over the past 10 years, over 30 years, uh, we work in China for 30 years. We work with China company uh, customers, and we uh, uh, so that all of you in China, uh, every day you go, uh, you travel. All the transportation vehicles, uh, you are enjoying the service of our products. Uh, China's real uh, high-speed rail, we are proud of that China's high-speed rail is leading the world. And the new development, we have some think about in-depth innovation. Uh, Connor, uh, Connor, we have new innovation. We have three points for it. First, we need to have innovation for the core parts uh, dominated by China. If the next step, automation product should uh, use more uh, the mature parts from China, for example, uh, the chips. Uh, second, uh, we are uh, doing digital innovation. China is uh, one of the, uh, have a, a lot of leading digital companies, so digital innovation. Uh, these products can help uh, Knorr uh, companies. It can help Connor's business globally. Number three, we uh, recycle the, uh, the carbon nutrition uh, demand from the government. The carbon, uh, the peak carbon uh, neut neutrality will be our goal. 2030, all the companies of our group, including that of China, uh, will reduce to 50% of 2016. It's more than the carbon emission of our company, but also our entire supply chain upstream and downstream. Of course, uh, multi-companies, multinational companies, when we do in-depth in innovation, it's important for Chinese societies. We have some aspirations. We hope that CCG and the government industrial policy can make a clear uh, definition. If uh, a multinational company doing in-depth uh, innovation, whether the what's the relationship with the China's self-innovation? Actually, China's self-innovation, it is the government's uh, initiative. The multinationals' innovation in China 
For example, we use the core parts in China. We uh, apply our IP in China. Can we be counted as China's self-innovation? If there can be uh, this kind of clear policy, that will be very good for multinational companies to do more uh, innovation in China. That will be great for the core parts development in China. That will be very good for China's uh, position in the global supply chain. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Xu. Actually, uh, multinational companies over the past 40 years have created a lot of jobs and bring a lot of technologies to China. Many uh, MNC they have the in China for China strategy, but uh, self innovation and the MNC innovations. Is becoming a very important benefit to the Chinese economy and the Chinese supply chain. I think this is a, a chapter for China's own innovations. And through the joint effort in this field, through the representations of these companies, it is actually very beneficial for the Chinese companies and enables those companies to have more presence in this different field. Thank you very much, Mr. Xu. Now we'd like to present to you. DSM it is a Europe company. Actually, Mr. Zhou, who is here, the president of DSM, has always talked about empowering healthcare industry. And as China is entered into such a stage, the healthcare industry is actually a very important industry. So we like to invite the representatives from DSM to talk about how do we uh, use this opportunity for innovation for joint development? Thank you very much, Director Liu. Thank you very much for C CG to give us a very good opportunity. So I am actually the least, uh, the last speaker. It is actually around 5 p.m. I'm going to stick to the time. Thank you. Please allow me to give a brief introduction toward my company, DSM. I really want to thank CCG to give me this opportunity. I actually uh, arrived here from Shanghai to here. DSM is a company with 190 years history. The innovation is written in our DNAs. The DSM, no matter if you written in Dutch language, So at the very beginning, it is Dutch state mines, and currently we are focusing on the heavy chemical industries, chemical petrol industries, and today we call 85% of our business is about nutrition and health, green life. So today we talk about innovation. I think let's talk about the COVID-19 pandemic, which is happening right now. And as I talk to Tony, who is from the airport. How do we use the better diagnostic method to give better treatment, to provide better nursery? We could see that when the disease has not happened, how do we prevent something from happening? It is actually in the world of people, and it's also in the world of animals. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, I still remember that in our country, there is a very severe uh, COVID-19 pandemic. We still remember the swine uh, influenza. In the year 19, 2019, we could, I still remember the swine plague in China at the time. The price of the uh, pork has, rising, has been rising, and it's actually creating down Chinese economy. In the year 2020, and in the world of the people, we have experienced the human swan fever, that is the COVID-19. So this DSM is actually works on the disease prevention and control. So that concludes the introduction of DSM. We have 5,300 people. In 1963, we started to do the trade with the Chinese government. In 1990s, we started the investment in China and we built our office, our factories. Currently, we have 48 
different persons and 26 different factories. Our R&D and we are headquartered in Shanghai. Yesterday, the total revenue of our company is around 1.5 US dollars. I like to talk about the innovations for multinationals. For multinationals, we are facing the new challenges and opportunities. In the past 20 to 30 years, it used to be the 1.0 model. So we actually bring the good things in other countries to re replicate them in China and to sell it in the Chinese market. With the rising of the Chinese economy and with the rising and the competition from the local market, every single multinationals, no matter which industry they are working in, the Chinese company is actually catching up. How do we transit from the period of 1.0 to the period of 2.0? How do we improve our R&Ds to address the local demand? This is actually the problem that multinationals is facing right now. It is also a very huge opportunity. If we can do a good job in the market, the market would be very huge. In the year 2020, the average GDP per capita in China is actually surpassing 150 years in a short period of 15 years. The number is going to be doubled. You still remember what Beijing looks like 20 years ago. And I still remember that if we are coming here to Beijing in a short period, we are go also going to double the numbers. And for the multinationals, we are looking into these new opportunities. How do we do the transient period, how transitional period? How do we do the localizations? It is also going to be a very good way for the product research and innovations. I've been participating in Shanghai's WeChat group, and I have done a uh, survey that is a WeChat group, including 156 directors of multinationals in Shanghai. And I think these 166 uh, CEOs is working in over 10 different industries. And, uh, these CEOs are cared about how to do the innovations in the local market, especially under the dual circulation uh, ground policies. And believe all the multinationals is going to welcome these challenges and against this backdrop. Thank you very much, Mr. Zhu. For the interest of time, I am going to quickly, quickly wrap it up. Mr. Zhu has helped me to summarize the theme of this panel. For 100, so the ideas of 136 CEOs and one WeChat group's concern is also representing the concerns of the multinationals in China. We should figure out where the future looks like, what is going to be the future. So, following this opportunity, uh, on behalf of CCG, I'd like to thank the panelists for sharing such an exciting information from the industry. And we also like to thank the listeners for you patiently waiting for us to participate in our session. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Kalama. Ladies and gentlemen, as we are running late, we will take a very short break for five minutes, and we'll reconvene in this room for the last round table. Thanks. Uh,各位来宾,因为我们的时间比较紧张,我们会短暂的休息五分钟,请您注意时间,及时回到房间内参加最后一个圆桌。Okay. Okay. Okay. We will only break for very. We'll take only a very brief, brief break, and the, the and the next round table will start very soon. And please be ready to take seat. 呃，由于时间有限，我们下一个圆桌马上会开始，请各位准备就坐，谢谢。
除了感情的感谢家庭，我们能分享家庭的一些感谢家庭的一些那个三和人家庭，就在那里，就我们明年再见。行，好好好，就就就明年晚，跟晚跟晚了，因为我们展览上面。
尊敬的各位来宾，本次会议即将开始，请您尽快就座，并将手机等通讯设备关闭或置于静音状态。谢谢您的合作。Ladies and gentlemen, the event will begin shortly. Can we please ask for you to kindly take your seats? We would like to remind you again to switch off all mobile phones and put electronic devices to silent mode. Thank you for your cooperation. 尊敬的各位来宾，本次会议即将开始，请您尽快就座，并将手机等通讯设备关闭或置于静音状态。谢谢您的合作。Ladies and gentlemen, the event will begin shortly. Can we please ask for you to kindly take your seats? We would like to remind you again to switch off all mobile phones and put electronic devices to silent mode. Thank you for your cooperation. 尊敬的各位来宾，本次会议即将开始，请您尽快就座，并将手机等通讯设备关闭或置于静音状态。谢谢您的合作。Ladies and gentlemen, the event will begin shortly. Can we please ask for you to kindly take your seats? We would like to remind you again to switch off all mobile phones and put electronic devices to silent mode. Thank you for your cooperation. 尊敬的各位来宾，本次会议即将开始，请您尽快就座，并将手机等通讯设备关闭或置于静音状态。谢谢您的合作。Ladies and gentlemen, the event will begin shortly. Can we please ask for you to kindly take your seats? We would like to remind you again to switch off all mobile phones and put electronic devices to silent mode. Thank you for your cooperation. 尊敬的各位来宾，本次会议即将开始，请您尽快就座，并将手机等通讯设备关闭或置于静音状态。谢谢您的合作。Ladies and gentlemen, the event will begin shortly. Can we please ask for you to kindly take your seats? We would like to remind you again to switch off all mobile phones and put electronic devices to silent mode. Thank you for your cooperation. 啊、uh, ，OK。呃，大家好，我是。Distinguished guests, I'm Victor Go. For this round of roundtable discussion, we are officially going to start. The topic we are going to discuss is about focusing on the innovation strategy to foster the stronger global collaboration in China's green development plans. I heard that today's simultaneous interpretation is going to be very good. I am going to moderate in the English, so I believe there are so many different ambassadors who are sitting here. To uh, declare open this last round of discussion for this afternoon, I hope it will not be the least, and uh, uh, we will be uh, talking about China-Europe economic cooperation. What's next? I understand simultaneous interpretation is excellent, so I will uh, be using English to moderate our session. We have 10 distinguished panelists, and uh, we will talk about a whole range of issues, including opportunities and challenges and major issues in what China and Europe can do to boost cooperation and to overcome whatever issues there are. Now, without further ado, may I invite, as the first panelist to make her speech, the Her Excellency Alanka Sohantolnik, who is the ambassador of Slovenia to China. Uh, you may know Slovenia took over the rotating chairmanship of the Council of EU as of July the 1st this year. As a result, Her Excellency the Ambassador is now not only the ambassador of Slovenia, but also the dean of the EU countries' embassies here in China. 
and uh, I believe we will listen very carefully to what Her Excellency has to say in terms of how cooperation can be further boosted between China and EU and China and European countries. We need to do a lot of things because EU used to be the largest trading partner for China for many years. Now it ranks number two. And China has learned a great deal from European countries in general. You may know for sure uh, China learned Marxism from a number of European countries, socialism, and uh, uh, great Chinese leaders like Zhou Enlai and Deng Xiaoping all studied and worked in European countries. So we have a lot of goodwill towards Europe as a whole, many European countries in, in particular, and we hope through our discussion, our goodwill towards Europe and China, European uh, friendship and constructive relations can be further boosted. Without further ado, Your Excellency Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. And before starting, I would just like to congratulate the uh, Centre uh, for China and Globalization to be included among the most important um, global think tanks, to be precise, on the 64th place of the among the top uh, 100 think tanks worldwide. In my intervention, uh, I'm going to focus on three points. Uh, starting with the more general on climate change and green transition, then WTO, World Trade Organization, and investments. Um, on climate change, uh, with the UN Biodiversity Conference in Kunming and the UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow this year, 2021 is truly a fundamental year for collective global action on climate change. And floods both in China and in Europe in the last weeks have been a stark reminder that the climate change is not a crisis on a time horizon, but a crisis that needs to be dealt with here and now. Allow me to introduce briefly a European Green Deal. Uh, in the late 2019, the EU committed to become the world's uh, first climate neutral continent by 2050. The European Green Deal was unveiled as a comprehensive plan to make our ec economy and society ready, facilitating the resetting of our economic policy to better correspond to the challenges of the global climate crisis. The European Green Deal overarching objective is the transition towards a climate neutral and environmentally sustainable economy by 2050 with the ambition to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% by 2030 compared to 1990 levels. In the middle of this month, on 14th of July, the EU Commission put forward the necessary legal framework for a green transition, that is so-called Fit for 55 package. The package is a package of 12 initiatives, one completely new, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, and, and 11, which are about bolstering existing legislation. These proposals are full, fully in line with the WTO rules and other EU international commitments. As a result of the EU's existing climate and energy legislation, the EU's greenhouse gas emissions have already fallen by 24% compared by, uh, to 1990, while the EU economy has grown by around 60% in the same period, so decoupling growth from emissions. In short, that proves that green transition is also an opportunity. But of course, the climate change is inherently global. That's why it was so important, the, Chinese, the announcement of the Chinese President Xi Jinping during the last General Assembly in September last year in New York, where the announcement, the Chinese announced that the peak of carbon emissions before 2030 and pledged to achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. Also, a 14 five-year plan uh, is putting climate and environment sustainability goals among the priorities. Alignment on global environmental standards and ambitious levels, level of resolve 
is needed from all international partners. And due to its size and its importance in climate mitigation efforts, in particular from China. Allow me also to quickly introduce the new mechanism, carbon border adjustment mechanism, also for, uh, for the reason because it got some traction in the uh, Chinese media. Mechanism is a, an environmental measure which aims to avoid risk of carbon leakage as the EU increases its climate ambition. The, the decarbonization objectives of EU action would be sharply curtailed if EU business in certain emission intensive sectors were to transfer production to other countries with less stringent emissions constraints. This could lead to an increase of total emissions globally, thus undermining the effectiveness of the emissions mitigation policies. Uh, the EU also intends to respond constructively to new challenges like digital transformation, and Slovenian presidency of the Council of the European Union intends to work towards a more resilient Europe based on the concept of open strategic autonomy. The concept of open strategic autonomy is composed of various elements. And without an element of openness, we cannot imagine strategic autonomy. Strength does not come from self-sufficiency, but from the ability to build trust and to cooperate among partners. It is therefore important that the EU's trading partners are an integral part of this approach. The second point is on WTO and the importance of constructive engagement within WTO and the 12th Ministerial Conference later this year was already mentioned at the panels earlier today. This year, in which we are marking 20, the 20th anniversary of China's WTO membership, we are very much counting on China's positive engagement in the WTO negotiations on the reform, as well as comprehensive rules on industrial subsidies. Mr. Chen Deming, CCG Honorary Chairman and former Minister of Commerce, uh, has already mentioned today China's resolve on the reform of SOEs and subsidies and, and the equal treatment for SOEs, private and foreign companies, which is and the importance of their MC12 later in the year. It is of critical importance for the WTO as an organization to have a successful ministerial conference with a limited set of concrete deliverables, one of them fisheries, subsidies, subsidies negotiations, trade and health. It will be also important to lay a foundation for a meaningful reform program with outcomes to be delivered during next year MC13. Among important MC12 outcomes, we would like to see establishment of the working group on WTO reform, progress on joint statement initiatives, reference to the importance for the WTO to contribute to sustainability and trade and environment, strength and disciplines on industrial subsidies and, S and SOEs, as already mentioned, and positive contribution on agriculture, but coming from Europe with realism on what we can achieve. The third point, on investment and on CHI. The political conclusion of the EU-China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment in December 2020, after seven years of negotiations, demonstrated the common will to create new opportunities for investments while rebalancing some of the asymmetries between European and Chinese economies. 
The draft agreement is creating legal certainty to investors both in China as in Europe. Now agreement needs to be legally reviewed and translated into the 23 official languages of the European Union member countries before it can be presented for adoption and ratification. However, the ratification process of CHI cannot be separated from the evolving dynamics of the wider EU-China relations. Among others, sanctions and counter-sanctions imposed on 22nd of March create a new situation. The prospects for the CHI's ratification will depend on how the situation evolves and on the wider landscape of the EU-China relations. In conclusion, I would like to repeat after Nicolas Chapuis, EU ambassador to China, uh, at the yesterday's opening of the seventh annual China uh, Globalization Forum. And uh, I'm quoting Ambassador Chapuis, but actually Ambassador Chapuis quoted the high EU High Represent Representative for Foreign Relations, Joseph Borrell. Quotation, working together, meaning for ch China and the EU, is not only an option, but a necessity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. You raised uh, uh, quite a few important points, and uh, we will very carefully uh, consider them and reflect them to the authorities here in Beijing, I hope. And I particularly like the uh, emphasis you mentioned in terms of climate change and cooperation between China and Europe as a whole. I think uh, uh, lots of people here in China expressed our uh, sympathy for the flood victims in Germany and several other Western European countries, and China is very grateful for the expression of support and uh, concern by European countries, European companies, including Daimler Benz, whose representative spoke in the previous uh, session. Uh, but I believe the recent unprecedented extraordinary natural disasters may be real symbols that climate change effect is really coming and coming very, very soon. We need to cooperate in the fall to prevent that the changes are moving in the direction and moving beyond the point of no return because otherwise great catastrophes may be waiting mankind as a whole. So cooperation is a must. China and Europe need to stand together in dealing with these important global changes and global challenges. Thank you again, Ambassador. Allow me to give the floor to His Excellency Jose Augusto Duarte, the Ambassador of Portugal to China, a great personal friend of mine, and who until June the 30th was the Dean of European uh, EU Ambassadors in China. And uh, Ambassador Duarte, we are all ears in listening to your views as to how China and EU can cooperate for mutual benefit. What's next? Thank you very much, Victor Gao. And uh, it's a pleasure being in here. So I'm very grateful for the invitation that was addressed to me. Well, uh, the title of this um, seminar today in here is China-Europe Economic Cooperation, What's Next? Well, if we're speaking about China-Europe economic cooperation, uh, we speak mandatorily about globalization. Globalization, in my point of view, means interdependence. Interdependence means mutual trust and mutual support based on common rules for all of us. Nationalisms, protectionisms, unilateralisms are the opposite in my point of view, of what globalization should be. So, since nowadays we are under uh, the process of uh, sanctions and counter-sanctions that my colleague Alenka already mentioned, I think either we remain hostage of this situation and we just cross our arms saying that we can do anything 
because we are under sanctions to each other, or we try to do the best under the current circumstances, and on a pragmatical way, we try to rebuild trust and confidence that will be much more beneficial. Me, I'm not a resignated person, and I'm a diplomat of a European country in China. So I will never give up in trying to do the best we can to reveal trust, to reveal these uh, common points that should be linking and relinking uh, the common interests of both China and Europe. I think it's, both, it's up to the Chinese side to tell what should be done from the European side to rebuild this trust. And should be also said from the European side to the Chinese side what they are expecting to be done under the current circumstances that could contribute to rebuild this trust. Kai is not dead, but is in a coma, for sure. And is in a coma for a, a long period of time since there is sanctions under over the European Parliament and the European Parliament, it's indispensable to approve the ratification of CHI. So we are not going to have the ratification of CHI for the next months or maybe the next years. So what should we do to rebuild this trust? I think that there is um, some positive steps to rebuild this trust that will be very good to create a new environment little by little ratification of international treaties on labor, for example. That is something that China compromised with the European Union on doing, not because the European Union was asking, but as the Chinese official said, because it's good for China. So this thing, which is a point of friction and misinterpretations in the West, would not cost anything to China, but would send a good and a positive sign towards the outside world. Then the WTU reform. I think it's something that everybody considers that it's necessary, it's indispensable. The role of China in there, it's indispensable for a positive outcome on this. Then, uh, I mean, the level playing field, the international rules and standards that China can also start to apply a bit more um, and, and showing it clearly. Then also, in my point of view, something that would be very important on a pragmatical way, which is for Chinese authorities to listen more the foreign enterprises that have investments in China. In my point of view, it's not just the foreign embassies that are natural bridges between the West and China. Foreign investors, foreign enterprises with interests in China are the best allies, the best friends. They should be treated accordingly to listen to them because they are natural friends in a process that can be very influential in the West. So listen to them, work with them, and not mistrust on them. Um, said, uh, finally, also, the environmental and the climate change agenda. We know that the United States, it's not, and it's taking a bit more time to be on the same board as Europe and China were for a long period of time in this process. This is an, uh, the revision of the economic agenda based on a green uh, agenda. It will be something that Europe and China could work and should work together on a faster path that will create also a positive environment. So, I mean, my time is over, but I think there is some ideas that regardless of the sanctions and counter-sanctions, we should build these positive steps and building trust between ourselves uh, that could be certainly mutually beneficial for all of us and not for general, just for one side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency. Very important points mentioned by the uh, Ambassador, and uh, uh, especially the point you mentioned about CAI, C-A-I. I hope China and Europe will really demonstrate wisdom, vision, courage, 
and uh, uh, foresight in rem removing the obstacles to make sure that CHI is formally coming into effect because CHI is not only just good for China, it's good also for Europe. It's truly a mutually beneficial thing and I hope in the middle of the pandemic, which is still not yet over, if we can have the breaking news that China and EU finally overcame, overcome all the obstacles and CHI is official, for example, this will help mankind lift themselves out of the very much of a gloom as a result of the pandemic. So let's work together to make sure that CHI formally, officially comes into effect. Thank you, Ambassador. Now, uh, allow me to call on two distinguished panelists from the Chinese side to listen to what they have to offer on this very important topic of how China and EU can cooperate with each other and what's next. Thank you. So the first is Mr. Feng Zhongping, who is the Director of Institute of European Studies, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, CAS. In China, we usually call CAS as the biggest think tank larger than CCG, uh, even though we classify differently, so we are a social think tank, they are a very much of a government think tank, very big, very powerful, very influential, and sometimes creating a lot of impact on government decisions. So, Mr. Fong, we are all ears. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Go, Victor. Well, not that powerful. <laughs> Thank you to the CCG for inviting me. Uh, um, on China-European relations, um, there are many things we can discuss in this room. Um, I thought I would take this opportunity in four to five minutes to say a few words about China-EU comprehensive agreement, uh, investment, uh, agreement or investment. Uh, uh, Ambassador of Slovenia uh, uh, has just uh, mentioned uh, uh, about this. Um, we all know that relations between China and Europe is not as good, as smooth as before. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I think, you know, right now, sino European relations, relationship is in a difficult time. Um, over the past years, um, we are closely, you know, followed the events between the two powers, between the two um, um, economics. Uh, um, you know, the market access, uh, 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 there are two things which complace most, European companies complace most uh, uh, in the past two, uh, over the past years, one is the market access, one is the level playing field. Um, China, Europe, uh, including also United States, are three biggest economies in the world. Um, so, Victor, you, you are right. Trade is so important between our two, con two powers, uh, economies. Investment, technology, cooperation is so important for, for the two sides uh, in the past decades. Um, the significance of the CAI, China-Europe Comprehensive uh, Agreement uh, on Investment, is exactly a great effort made by both sides to address the above two issues, market access, play, uh, level playing field. No, seven years of hard negotiation was over. But we started another long march. I hope it's not that long. We need to work continuously. I think as a think tech man, I, I really would like to ask the two sides to continually to work for the final ratification uh, uh, um, on this important agreement. My second point I would like to make is about the role of the think tanks um, in both China and Europe. Um, we need to, think tanks, you know, are playing 
incredibly important rules to, nowadays in both China and Europe. Um, we need to make joint efforts to help to solve some misunderstandings, misperceptions uh, concerning two sides. Um, I think we could make some joint efforts to publish some papers, for example, over, say, AI, over other important issues uh, really consists both sides. Um, China is not a country which wants to export its ideology to other countries. So, but there are many things I think has been, have been politicized. That is why I think, you know, there is, we, we need to strengthen the rules, the cooperation among the think tanks between China and Euro Europe. Finally, there are many discussions today about U.S.-China-Europe trilateral relations. Um, I think we understand uh, uh, perfectly Europe has its own interest as far as China, interest, uh, chi as far as China policy is concerned. Thank you. I adhere. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fong. Thank you. I think uh, Mr. Fong also talked uh, very focusedly on KAI, CAI which is very important. I hope China and Europe will not wait for another seven years to wrap up this uh, CAI agreement, putting it into real execution. I hope we can act now. There are difficulties, there are issues, but we need to overcome them, especially when we look around the world, when we see these extraordinary, abnormal climate disasters happening around us in Europe, in America, in China, elsewhere in the world, we really need to act because otherwise we may be running out of time. Thank you. Now, uh, the next speaker I want to give the floor to is Mr. Cui Hong Jian, CCG non-resident senior fellow, also director of the Department of European Studies at the China Institute of International Studies, CIISS. I think you know CISS is affiliated with the Chinese Minister of Foreign Affairs, and Mr. Tsui has been a long-term, uh, long-standing expert on European affairs. I have many occasions having the great honor of working with him as panelists together in CGTN discussions about European mm -hmm. issues, other international issues, etc. Mr. Tsui, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Victor Gao. Uh, I'm very honored to talk uh, with you about the cooperation between China and uh, Europe. Last year, uh, uh, last year is more difficult than this year. Last year, the pandemic was more serious than this year. One year later, we can break the issues into two categories. One is the issues that are improving. For example, most uh, many countries in the world are rolling out a vaccine plan. We have reason to be optimistic for future. For example, EU quickly uh, the EU will uh, have more uh, ways to deal with the pandemic. Uh, Blind uh, mentioned that 70% of the EU population have got uh, vac vaccination for the first time. Uh, EU will go back to new normality. European uh, football, may, football champion uh, was uh, very uh, 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 beautiful. That means the normality is come, uh, has come back to EU. For China and the EU, uh, we have some reason to be optimistic. And this optimization is expanding from last year to this year. The trade between China and uh, Europe is expanding. Besides the traditional trade, uh, we want to uh, Break, make breakthrough in a lot of new areas. For example, EU want to make breakthrough in two areas. One is a green deal, the other is digital economy. 
and China and the EU are uh, doing the high-level talk. We have these optimistic factors. However, uh, last year we forecasted this year it's getting worse. For example, the impact of the pandemic on economy is not over yet. Pandemic. So we are thinking about the post-pandemic um, errors, and but we are still in the middle of the pandemic. This is a kind of reality. The pandemic is still damaging the society and also the economy. We are always being interrupted by the virus and also the pandemic. This is also going to be a problem not only in China but also in Europe. Against the backdrop of the pandemic, there are some of the worries. Some of the difficulties we used to imagine is actually being powered by politics and laws. We have understand that the European Union has came out with a series of laws and regulations. So I can tell my Europe's friends in a friendly manner. Europe is in the middle of empires of a very lifestyle and regulations. I think EU is turning it into the itself into an empire of regulations and rules. But actually, at the same time, they came up with the CIBM. While they are promoting the digital economy, they have came up with two acts and also CMPR. And recently, they are promoting the supply chain laws. So I could see that for Europe, the European Union is trying to compete with each other and provide more useful tools for it itself. So that is to say, no matter for the government or the companies, for all the partners with the EU, this is also posing the new problems and the questions. The government and other different economies The other different uh, national governments is actually facing a lot of difficulties while negotiating with the European Union. The European Union is going too far and too quick that other countries cannot catch up with. For companies, the biggest problem is about the cost of compliance. It is always rising. I was talking with the officials from the European Union, it includes the carbon edge and also the GDPRs and also supply chains. I believe there is also a lot of divides between the European Union countries, between its government and its private sector. I think moving forward, if the European Union wants to have a long-lasting cooperation, one thing it needs to address is about the confidence and the capacity. So what does it mean? The mutual trust in between China and Europe are far from enough. We need to continue to enlarge our cooperation capacity. The Europe has came up with a series of regulations and rules. We could see it as a part of the wisdom because it needs to compete to uh, continue to protect themselves and uh, improve their competitiveness. But I think the EU should put the makeup and reasons of the laws in an open-up manner. No single trade partner in the world is more suitable to discuss these problems other than China and Europe. But I think European Union is going too fast and too quick, and they are, we are los losing the patient and with the rules. What is the relationship between the new regulations and innovations? So with so many regulations coming out, coming out, how will we unleash the potential of innovation for companies? I see something contradictory to each other. The EU has emphasized about the resilience, but on the other hand, they are trying to implement more requirement, more regulations to the companies. I think this is not only a question that the European friends should think about. This is also some 
Chinese entrepreneurs should think about. The last part is about the CII. CNI. So some of the European friends call it Kai. So for the Chinese people, we call it Thai. So the Thai, Kai is actually a mutual interest between China and Europe. And Thai is also refers to the vegetable in Chinese. But the Thai is deeply frozen. To put it objectively, in this dish of vegetable, in this dish of Thai, my European friends would get more. If you want to eat this dish, why do you put down your knife and put down your fork? We talk about the account consumption, the political risk lying in front of us should not impact and invade the trade and economic sector. For the Chinese, we have always talked about the rule-based regulations. And if we enhance the rules, the political element came to come to us and disturb us. I believe this is going to disturb the future ties between China and Europe. But I agree with ambassadors word that although the chai was chai was frozen, it is still on the table. So how do we unfrozen it? How do we refresh it? And how do we continue our dinner? It is actually in the interest of China and in the Europe. And I think the EU is facing a very important post-pandemic recovery. So do not miss this the table and do not miss this vegetable. Thank you. That is what I want to say. Uh, again, many important points, especially the point you mentioned about CAI, either Kai or Thai, as many Chinese pronounce them. Uh, we do need to get our acts together, both for China and EU, to make sure that this CAI moves forward rather than being blocked by whatever means. And uh, both sides need to demonstrate wisdom, as I mentioned, and courage. And also, uh, Mr. Fung just now mentioned that we don't want to wait for another seven years. But allow me to share one point. In another seven years, the size of the Chinese economy will definitely be larger than that of the United States. So you do not want to negotiate with a country whose economy is on the rise and rapid rise especially when other regions are suffering downhill pressures, and then you do not participate in this rapid rise of the Chinese economy. So I hope European countries and the Chinese side will work together to overcome all these difficulties. Again, just now, the uh, Excellency, uh, the Ambassador of Portugal, advised China to listen very carefully. I would say we need to listen very carefully to chambers of commerce like uh, 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 Mr. George Utka heads. He's the president of the EU Chamber of Commerce in China. I've known Mr. Utka for many years. I liked his sense of humor and his grasp on real top corporate management. And uh, I hope he can give us his view and his chamber's view on how China and European countries and EU in particular can work together to move forward. What's next, George? Well, thank you, uh, Victor, for these uh, credits. Uh, undeserved, of course, uh, but nevertheless well taken. Uh, it's a great honor to be here, and of course, life is beautiful. If you are a European businessman in the fastest growing market in the world, and my company's expectation is that China will stand for 30% of global growth in the next 10 years, as much as all the OECD countries together. And in my chemical sector, it's actually even more pronounced. It's 60%. 60% of global growth until 2030 will be in China, and China will stand for half of the global chemical market uh, in 2030. So you have to be here. Uh, Victor was right in saying that China is um, the biggest uh, part, trading partner 
in, um, in goods, uh, but not the biggest trading partner, uh, because that's the United States. Uh, we are trading uh, with China uh, 500 million euro a day, so we are selling to China 500 million euro a day, whereas China sells to Europe 1.1 billion euro a day. Hence, that's why we are the largest trading partner, because the European market is twice as important to China as is China to the European exporters. And as a matter of fact, if you look into the export as a market, not as investor, export, four years ago, Europe exported more to Switzerland than to the People's Republic of China. Um, we are still exporting 40% more to Britain and 90% uh, more to uh, America in goods. In services, it's even more pronounced. The trade in good services between the US and Europe is uh, six times as big as the China-Europe uh, service sector. It's 50 billion on the one side and uh, 300 billion between the US and Europe. So when you put these together, that's the normal definition of trading partner is goods and services. The US is 40% more important than the People's Republic of China. So we can do better. Uh, you can see that European customers like Chinese products, but it's uh, definitely there's a mismatch of market growth, market potential, and market access as the figures uh, indicate. So we should not get complacent. European Chamber uh, is very bad in complacency. We are always driving and want to have improvement. Uh, we believe that China can change, and that's why every September we come up with our little Bible of 430 pages and 900 recommendations. Unfortunately, the book doesn't shrink, uh, but we are still determined to pinpoint where China actually can do better. Let me get to the one point where actually we have a lot of things in common. Now, if you look into Xi Jinping's pledge of carbon neutrality by 2060, that's where Europe can really st step up to the plate and engage with China. Now, Xi Jinping's verdict of getting there sounds impossible because at this stage China is so dependent still on coal and other areas and to reach carbon neutrality by 2060 China has to come up with 87 percent of renewable energy and China is very far away from that. In order to achieve that goal China has to shut down 660 gigawatt of coal-fired power stations until 2060 660 gigawatt by chance happens to be the entire installed power fleet of the European Union. Just imagine what kind of endeavor that's going to be. But again, China's ambitious, and so are we. We think uh, that can be achieved if we work together, and working together means that we have open borders and that we have open business conditions. So in order to come up with help from Europe for Xi Jinping's pledge 2060, we definitely need China to move uh, tremendously. And that also means that we have to have more people on the ground. Uh, we are definitely uh, a minority since forever here, but now we are on the edge of becoming extinct. And that's a real challenge to us. There are more foreigners in Luxembourg than in Shanghai and Peking together. How is this possible? And 600,000 foreigners in China. There is a definite problem of uh, people not coming back. We need these experts, we need these managers, we need the engagement of people with China to also fester better understanding. We need, in my company, young European managers to work in China to get the China bug in order to actually understand that it's not always like, oh, we have done this before, we don't do this, this is a kind of German attitude, but actually the can-do of China. But if we can't get the people here, then actually we can't get the China bug back home. We need to watch out that we don't overdo localization. That's a real threat for people and companies uh, going for globalization. And we need more Chinese in our labs. We need more Chinese in Europe, in Germany, in all these, these places. There has to be people-to-people -people exchange that also might help in order to overcome this kind of misunderstandings and nationalism that is cooking up in Europe as well as in China. So, ladies and gentlemen, there we are. Uh, we have uh, good business, there's more to do. Um, and again, uh, in order to 
come across uh, ideas about uh, Xi Jinping's 2060. We are ready to serve, but we need more people in order to exactly do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, I like your point and emphasis on climate change, uh, carbon neutrality, carbon peaking, etc. Just to make a very quick point to boost up your confidence in how China will achieve the uh, carbon peaking and carbon neutrality. You may or may not have noticed one thing. There is a bank called the Huaxia Bank in China, which has already declared that by 2024, it will achieve carbon neutrality. This is the first bank in China which has made up that determination to achieve that. Internally, I understand, they have a very detailed plan, very scientifically worked out a plan to achieve carbon neutrality for that bank. Now, President Xi Jinping, who is the General Secretary of the Communist Party of China, has already declared to the whole party, to the whole nation, that China need to achieve the 2030 goal, 2060 goal. If you keep that in mind, the Chinese society mobilizes as the party uh, 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 leads, and for the 2060 goal, amazingly, according to the information I've been provided, China may actually achieve that goal ahead of time. So this creates a lot of opportunities for China and European countries to work together. And by working together in achieving China's peaking and neutrality goal, it is not only for the benefit of the Chinese people and the European people, it's for mankind as a whole. This should be considered as an exciting moment for us to work together. And if executing CAI can help the Chinese and the Europeans in making greater contribution and benefiting more, let's do the right thing. Now, uh, next, I want to give the floor to uh, Monsieur Antoine Wei Dong Zhang, who is the uh, Vice President of Chairman of Commerce and Industry of France in China, and he is also the Vice Senior Vice President of Ulano Asia. Thank you very much, Antoine. You have the floor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of the French Chamber of Commerce, I am participating in today's meeting. This is the first time I'm actually participating in today's meeting. I really want to thank CCG for your kind invitation. French Chamber of Commerce, as we have a brief it at CCI China. We have 1,600 member companies, which is majorly being dominated by French companies, Europe companies, and in the recent few years, the Chinese government allowed the Chinese company to be a part of the activities in the Foreign Chamber of Commerce. That's the reason why we have a lot of activities, a very wide range of opportunities. We have worldwide companies. We also have some of the small and medium-sized companies. And actually, we are working in all kinds of the industries. As a representative of our Chamber of Commerce, it is very difficult for us to attend this meeting. Our feeling to the market is also very different with the different industries that we are working in. So how do we work in the market? So how do we launch our practice in the market? I think I am going to talk from the practical perspective. So let me talk it from the companies and also the Chamber of Commerce's practice and the general scenario we are facing right now. In the recent few years, especially from last year, the beginning of last year, when the COVID-19 start to damage the world, the COVID-19 erupted, I could see that some of the company is declining and facing a lot of difficulties. But we all hope that we could go through this 
difficulty time as quickly as possible. But some of the companies might be heavily affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. But some of the companies actually been benefited by that. Uh, there are a lot of luxurious products in France. Young people and they like the luxuries. But these industries in China, since the pandemic increased, so their feeling is different from other industries. I heard that downstairs the trade center and the big shopping malls they become the biggest and the third largest luxurious selling center. French has the most luxurious. These industries feel excited in China. Uh, annual growth is over 10 percent or several per, uh, dozen percent. Not a lot of companies feel that way. This is a, a CCG. A think tank is not a place we only say the good news. We need to talk about the challenges and the recommendations. I have two recommendations. First, EU uh, business chamber chairperson said the first challenge is mobility. We hope we can resume the travel uh, in EU, EU, in Europe for French. That's the same case in Beijing, in Shanghai. Our foreigners, foreign employees, we have reduced a lot of foreign high counts. There's a trend before the pandemic. It's difficult to do a lot of things. After the pandemic, we have some uh, 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 control measures uh, for uh, the COVID-19. Some people, they got work permit in China. It's difficult for them to come back to China. We didn't say that they are not allowed to come to China. PU letter, uh, new spe special visa, it's very difficult to apply for the visa. It's almost impossible to apply for the visa. I want to take this, I will, I will not talk about the size, Kai or other things. This is a specific issue. I hope that the, the, you, you can help us to resume the human uh, travel. Because with travel this morning, in, at the beginning of this uh, afternoon, uh, talking about uh, telling good story, we have more foreigners coming to China, and then we can tell good story. With our own narrative, is only part of the story. If we can have the foreigners coming to China, that will be a great improvement for the China's image. Tuesday, I attended an online event for Huawei in France. It's a, they invite 50 students in France. Normally, they invite them to China, to Shenzhen, to Beijing, to Shanghai. But last year, they cannot organize this event. Actually, if the 50 young people, they can visit China, they can visit Shenzhen, when they went back, when they tell the Chinese story, it will be a very good issue. Unfortunately, now currently, we cannot do that. We know that. Uh, it, we never say, China will never say clearly that we do not allow them to come in, but actually it's very difficult to apply for visa. Sometimes foreigners can come here, but their families cannot come with them. So here I want to uh, uh, ask this thing, uh, that I do not have the latest news. I don't know whether European friends have the latest news. We know that from next uh, January 1st, next year, foreigners' uh, income tax, individual income tax, 
we there will be change. Uh, national treatment, but this kind of national treatment, but foreigners, it has specialties. Foreigners, if we complete uh, the uh, uh, national treatment, the same treatment, it not be that appropriate. Can we say that? Can we do uh, another research? Uh, the uh, EU part, uh, the state con uh, the trade uh, council and the French council all. Uh, write, write, have written letter to state council. So, uh, for this, uh, in spite of the challenge, we have done a survey. Most uh, companies they would like to grow in China to invest in China. China, EU. My understanding is uh, there are a lot of things. We hope there can be equal treatment against each other. Our young people can go to Europe, can go to French. For study, they but the uh, European student cannot come to China. Uh, I hope that the fairness can be uh, respected. Thank you. Uh, you made uh, important suggestions, especially regarding the exchange of personnel between China and Europe, and uh, I hope uh, there will be due recognition of uh, vaccines produced by Chinese companies and European countries. I hope this will help a great deal in promoting the uh, restart of the human-to-human -human exchanges between China and EU, and this will play a big role. So let's uh, put science above everything else, and let's do the right thing to promote Europe, EU, recognize Chinese vaccines, and China do the same for European vaccines. Thank you very much. Now may I give the floor to Mr. William Weiliang. Zhao, Zhao Weiliang, Xianzheng, who is the country head of Total Energies China. Thank you. Uh, thank you, CCG. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, so I, I should speak in uh, Chinese. Oh. The panel as well. So let's. Um, I represent Total Energy, which is uh, which is uh, one of the largest uh, energy company in the world. Uh, I'm going to get down to what really matters to us because I have uh, four things I want to focus on. Two big topics, two small topics. Yeah, Europe and China, one thing that Europe and China will agree on for this year will be climate change issues. Let's admit that. It's one of the topics which impacts everybody. Uh, first of all, let's admit that uh, CO2 is not like air particulates or air pollution. Air pollution travels 100 kilometers, 1,000 kilometers, but CO2 or methane emission, doesn't matter where it is being emitted, it goes into the atmosphere. So the point is that CO2 and climate change is a global issue. And what I want to do here is that, first of all, Europe and China, if you look at where ETS system, the emission trading system, which China released on July 17th, in the structure and the intention is actually very similar to the European system. I think there's already been fantastic policy exchanges between the two. Implementation, it's also starting. There's been some comments about the limitation of the emission trading systems to say, ah, it's not enough, it's on the power exchange only, the pricing mechanism is right. Look, guys, the bottom line is that China is one of the largest market for CO2. The fact that China has committed to do this on the exchange mechanism. Uh, it, uh, without the tree, uh, the, uh, the double carbon goal cannot be achieved. Steps in tackling climate change. We have to admit that. And we think it is actually a fantastic thing for all co participants, that is transportation companies, energy companies, or renewable side oil company. We believe it is a major step towards climate change, achieving climate change, not for China, but for globally. So that's the first thing that China and Europe must cooperate on because it is a global issue. It is not a European issue. It is not a Chinese issue. Second of all, I'll, I'll be very succinct to cl close to the, uh, the timing of it. Europe, the particularity of Europe is that Europe does not simply focus on economic development. It focuses on economic development, industrial economic development, plus social development. In the end, for companies like us, equal access to energy Energy transition facilitates industrial transition, facilitates economic development, 
uh, transition as well, but also really what facilitates is social transition. Now, why is that important for Europe and China? For me, one of the largest similarities between Europe and China is that both societies are trying to create a more equal and fair society. Now, that is important because if you think about where BBW, the word build back better of the world, you can say part of it is climate change economic, but part of it is also creating a more equal and fair society. For that, Europe and China can work together, both developing its own economies, it's, but really achieving the same goal. So these are two things that are the big topics I believe China and Europe can actually cooperate on. I come down to the smaller things because for me, as a company, one of the most important thing is having actually things hitting the ground. You know, uh, it's not just, uh, you know, theoretical, it's things that we can actually do together. Two things that are very important, I believe, for China and Europe to agree on is standardization, what it means for climate change products. And this, I mean, what does it mean to have sustainable aviation fuel? Look, airplanes and ships travel both ways. They leave from Paris, it comes to Beijing, and goes the other way. To have different standards for sustainable aviation fuel, as well as marine fuel, is simply not appropriate for large societies like European Union and China. So China and Europe need to strive towards standardizing these climate products. What does it mean? And both society, both countries, uh, sorry, both regions need to agree on how to push forward these things so that it's better for economic development, it's better for companies like us to provide services, it's better for airlines, it's better for shipping companies, for overall. Last thing, what I want to talk about is something very small people don't talk about is that what we can bring to the table to China, but also as a European company, is health and safety. Yes, for us, without any doubt, in my operational level, as an operator of oil and gas, transportation, everything else, energy business, the loss of one single life and injury is simply not acceptable. And every day I start a meeting, every time, the beginning of the meeting, we talk about health and safety. So for us, where we can collaborate on the ground level, on the operational level, is having these standardization, not just on the products, but on the operational procedures, so we can be bring better welfare to societies. Again, European companies and Chinese companies not just work on economic development, but also on social development for the better of society. I think that's one thing China and Europe very much have in common. And last but not least, I agree to quote Jort Walker, and I'm going to, there are more expats in Luxembourg than in China. I'm not going to achieve any of the four things above if there are no people exchanges. So one of the most important things today, I, I'm not going to be able to create JVs, joint ventures. I'm not going to be able to have multi-billion dollar investment in China, vice versa, China in Europe as well, if people are not meeting, if people are just looking at each other over Zoom and Microsoft Teams, the deals are going to fail. So I beg you for all of us here, Europe and China, let's agree on the standards, let's have people seeing each other. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, William, for your important contribution to our discussion. Allow me to give the floor now to uh, Madam Li Ye, who is the Vice President and Head of Corporate Affairs and Government Relations of Merck Holdings China. Uh, you may or may not know that Merck Holdings has a corporate history of 352 years. This is probably the longest history uh, uh, of a company that I have personally come in touch with. And I very often regularly would discover that the medicines I use are actually produced by Merck. So <laughs> it is inside us, not only inside China, and very much, uh, 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 very important throughout the world. So, uh, Madam Li, we are all ears to listen to your contribution as to what China and EU can do together to improve our corporate relations and exchanges, and what's next? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Gao. Uh, dear friends, partners, currently, there are geopolitical and uh, COVID-19 impact uh, on China-Europe relations, but still there is a great development for European countries, Merck and other companies witness China's government's reform opening up and uh, improving domestic business environment. I hope in future 
uh, there can be a fair, transparent, non-discriminatory environment for foreign companies. For future, I want to talk about the three points related to MOX business development. Cooperation for high tech like uh, the semiconductor integrated circuit. There is a big room for cooperation. As a cross border technology company, Merck has uh, started the semiconductor business. We acquired the Huizhen Technology Intermolecular since 2019. Semiconductor material has become the fast growing business in China. We provide over 150 materials to over 100 uh, uh, chip companies in China. We provide the purification the technology, formula, process, and uh, material solutions, supporting uh, partners to provide uh, a good product and service. China semiconductor companies accounts for a big uh, market for the over 50 percent global uh, semiconductor com companies, the European companies supporting China companies' business tra transition, playing an important role. U Europe is one of the de most developed uh, regions for semiconductor growth, which is uh, s uh, s uh, a good, uh, strong historic strength uh, in many areas. The European take good advantage. Supply chain of the semiconductor pretty long with the industrial growth. The policies of different countries are playing important role. We hope that in China and uh, in we work with semiconductor partners with the promotion of business chambers. We can have mutual understanding to have more cooperation. Second, we need to work together in health and the medicine, the pharmaceutical industries to join hand against the pandemic. Merck and the partners uh, in the vaccines, and uh, vac we provided a lot of raw materials and the MR MRA uh, COVID vaccines lately uh, has played important role for the production. Actually, only Merck and the other companies can uh, provide the high quality tailored uh, the lipids. It's a global supply chain. In Germany, Merck is uh, working with Intech to uh, pro to buy Intech to for production. In China, uh, our product technology is supplying to the uh, major vaccine company. So in bio pharmaceuticals, EU and uh, America has advantages in the technology uh, areas. Uh, Cross-border cooperation cannot be accomplished without the EU, US, and uh, China. So for the vaccine development and the production, the uh, uh, mutual recognition becomes important. I hope that for vaccine rectification, we can realize the international mutual recognition. Third, for system development, uh, we need to do the uh, concrete cooperation. Lately, ESG uh, sustainable topics has uh, become important part for China EU cooperation for climate change. China provides uh, carbon picking and carbon neutrality commitment. EU is uh, the initiator of the uh, system development and uh, propose and the uh, leader for the Paris Agreement. Uh, EU has uh, released a Fit for 55 package plan. By 2030, uh, EU will reduce 55 percent of the carbon emission compared with the 1990s. M uh, supported the EU SDG economic uh, a clean energy target. We pro uh, push forward efforts to reduce, to enhance the efficiency energy use, reduce the GAG and the waste, and reduce the impact on climate change. Uh, Merck China has uh, received the Responsibility uh, Award by AICM to praise Merck's performance in social responsibility and uh, chemical management. This week, China has, we are considering 
our strategy, uh, mock China system of strategy, we will use the most strict uh, environmental standard to do good management. We are looking forward to uh, work be working with uh, partners for sustainability. In, gen uh, in the end, EU in new areas like semiconductor, biomedicine, vaccine, sustainability, uh, we are finding new opportunities in China. There are more opportunities than challenges. Cooperation and win-win is the topic for the high-quality development of China. Thank you, Mr. Li. Uh, 352 company, uh, year history company. Uh, I know that Merck, three businesses, one is semiconductors, uh, silicon. It is actually very inspiring. Why are medical companies to is going to do the semiconductors? I later find out Mark has been focusing on the medical product and also the medical equipment for many years. It also including some of the displays and the screens. That's the reason why they have a special understanding to this material. That is to say, in a sense, that they have expanded their business to semiconductors and also they took display screens. That is how they get connected with the semiconductors. Very interesting. And I like to add up one thing that if it goes to Mac, they have designed the world by themselves. You could see a hundred a company with centenary history designing their own logos. They do have a display in the industry. Thank you very much. May I have the great honor of giving the floor to Mr. Sun Yong Fu, who is a CCG senior fellow. Formerly, he was the director general of MOFCOM Department of European Affairs. For your information, a lot of knowledge of mine about Europe is actually picked up from Mr. Sun. So his uh, reservoir of knowledge and expertise about China-EU relations, difficulties, challenges, and what we need to work together to overcome all kinds of challenges. So, Mr. Sun, without further ado, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. But time is out already, <laughs> so I, I don't have time left. Up uh, to five minutes. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much for your kind words. I've been working with the China-Europe relations for a long period of time. That's the reason why I have yearly connections between my distinguished colleagues, especially George. I've known you for over 20 years, right? I still remember that at the early days when I meet you, I quarrel with you and we keep complaining each other. Trade relations in our youth when, when we were young, including the trade problems for the solar panels, the textiles, we have the quarrels and the conflicts and we actually discuss with each other every year and every year we got the white paper from the Chamber of Commerce and you have created a lot of trouble for my work. All the requirements from your side. Uh, I need to report to my boss for the requirement from your side, and I need to, you know, beautify the the requirement from your side in front of my boss. I still remember that thing. So, uh, but I think that compared with the current scenarios of the China-Europe relations, that was a period of love and affection. But currently, we are in a stage of conflictions. I think that we are at the valley of our bilateral relations. We are at the low point of our bilateral relations. This is not something that the companies from both sides wish to say, and this is not something that the people from both sides wish to say. Just as our ambassador has mentioned, we are lacking the mutual trust between China and the EU. If we want to build the cooperation, we need to have the uh, confidence in each other. I remember in the year 2008, in the financial crisis, 
Premier Li and Premier Wen has sent us a lot of delegations to come to the European Union to procure a lot of European products. And the Chinese government has made a commitment that we are going to help so many different national uh, sovereignty bonds uh, of the European Union's countries. We have the willingness to cooperate even in the difficult times. But today, we are facing the same difficult scenario, and we should build the new confidence. We should have the mutual trust and mutual support, because personally, I think that we don't have so many gap or conflicts in terms of the geopolitical issues. We believe in multilateralism is going to be a very good pathway for us to move forward. We don't think one superpower is going to dominate the world. So there are so many things to be shared between China and Europe, and we can collaborate in many different fronts. Just as our, Her Excellency uh, Alenka uh, has mentioned, in front of the COVID-19, and China is actually facing the double carbon target, carbon neutrality and carbon peak. We have so much to collaborate together. Europe is actually the largest trading partner for a consecutive 60 years, and last year, European Union was surpassed by the Asian countries. I think it is because of the uh, Brexit, and because Britain has a trading volume with China for around 10,000, uh, 10 million. And if you compare the number last year, so the number between EU is actually around 64 million, while with ASEAN countries, it is around 68. So without Brexit, EU is going to remain to the largest partner in China. and. Last year, actually, U.S. is surpassing China to become the largest trading partner. I know George is from Germany. And for the consecutive six years, China is actually the largest trading partner with Germany. We have a very good history, very good uh, historic foundations for the bilateral relations. Last year, we have been talking about the in the pandemic era. There is actually a 4.9 trade growth. If you compare the data of the first half of this year, China-Europe trade, according to the statistics of China, is actually surpassing 323 billion US dollar, while the trade between China and Germany is growing by 35% this year. Trade between China and France is growing by 43.9%. And our trade relations between China and Spain is also surpassing a 30% growth. Even at the most difficult times, even our political relations is not that good. Our pragmatic cooperation are not under, not interrupted or disturbed. This logic also works at the same time with the investment. From January to May, the total investment from China to European Union is actually surpassing a growth of 20%, while China's investment to the European Union is approaching 70%. The reason I'm talking about it is that we should look at the bright side. We should look at the difficulties, but we should look at the silver lining. I believe we have a very bright future. The difficulty would be very temporary. And we are going to use the current mechanism. That is the reason why we are talking here, to communicate with each other here. We need to talk frankly, to share with each other our difficulties. And moving forward, we are going to have a lot of things to collaborate in the multinationalism, multiple fronts. We are going to join hands together to overcome the difficulties. And I believe by building a collaborative relations, we are going to contribute to the world reco economic recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Sun. Successful Chinese government official.
uh, the so-called Mandarin official, as the British normally would say, very erudite, very experienced, very calm, very composed, and knows everything, and always make the right call on difficult issues. So I hope we will listen to him very carefully. Despite of all the difficulties right now in China-EU relations, we can have confidence that better days will come. Thank you very much, Mr. Sun. Uh, last but not least, may I give the floor to Mr. Zhang Huarong, who is the chairman of Huajian Group, and also very important for CCG, he's a vice chairman of CCG. And uh, Mr. Zhang, uh, Zhang Zong, Qing Yi, Fa Yan, Xie Ni, Ah, Dui, Xie Xie. I think we have a very difficult, uh, we have a very hard day. I think you are very hungry, and you hope that I could finish my work. Let me wrap it up in a short period of time. I'd like to give you a few stories. The first story is about, about my personal story. I was born in 1959, uh, 1958. So when I was born, China was experiencing the Grand Leap period. We are lacking food. We are very poor. And when I was entered into school, we have experienced the Cultural Revolutions. I actually dropped out of the school. And I still remember that I cannot understand the English alphabet because lacking of the school education. To put it frankly, I am the vice president of China Africa Friendly Association. I'm also uh, only of the United Nations for the African development. I graduated from the elementary school. After that, 40 years after that, I have done two keynote speech in United Nations because my personal history is related to the 40 years development in China. And China is actually opened up to the world, embracing the world. Indeed, we are a player in the manufacturing industry. My company has our story. We are a shoemaker. In 1983, we bought three shoemaking machines, and we have recruited eight workers to make shoes. In 1983, I still remember that 100% of my market, my uh, customers is the US buyers. Every year, I exported 2,000 different shoes to the US market. I still remember that in the year 2003, Ivanka Trump wear some shoes from our company. And we have built up and constructed a collaborative relations with the Trump group. And at that time, I was very glad that we are going to be flooded with the orders from the United States. But when Trump became the president, I have no order from the US. I received no order from the US. There is a lot of report and from the media about the US-China trade conflict. But I can tell you that I, I was rising from the poorest status. And we have become a multinational company. China do change a lot. So I'm going to tell you a uh, story to wrap it up. I have a lot of suppliers. All of my suppliers is from the EU, and I could see that my leathers is also being supplied by the EU players. At our peak day, we have an export volume of 800 million US dollars. In 2011, I went to France to find some of the clients. I take a train to Paris, and I actually find a trading company in the Paris. 
and they asked me, are you from Hong Kong or Taiwan? I could not forget that thing because at that time, there is so little about the Chinese story to be told. Let me tell you another story of the United States. I went to the United States in 2008. I was attending some of the ordering of some of the exhibitions in the United States. I went to the U.S. in Las Vegas. I actually attended to a fair of shoes. I could see that everything was there. Every single material, every single equipment was there. I think it is a shoes maker's heaven. And at that time, I was thinking that if China could become, should, should have some of the exhibition like this, that would be wonderful. In 2012, I went to Africa. I recruited a lot of uh, employees. And when I was training my employees and talking to them, for 100 different employees, five of them actually went down when they can, after 10 minutes in Africa, because they are liking the food. So when they are working in my factories, they gaining weight, they are actually gaining weight. For my African workers, averagely, when they are entered into my factories, after one year, every single one of them has gained 10 kilograms of the body weight. So because, do, why do I have a passion to invest in Africa? Because I, it reminds of me and China 50 years ago. So 50 years ago, when I was growing up, the biggest wish for me is to have a full meal. And today, there are so many different Europe companies and Africa, US companies has given the market to China, transferred the technology to China, invested in Chinese companies, and China is going to embrace the world to develop. At the same time, China is also creating a new development momentum in the world. The world needs China, and China also needs the world. Africa needs the investment from China, US, and the EU. Let's work hard and contribute to the job creations of the African markets. I'm proud to tell you that I have created 8,000 jobs in Africa. 60% of them are women. And when they are working in my factory, their family has been changed. In the past one year and a half, I was deeply intrigued. And I think that I suffered from the internal political changes in Ethiopia. Without the changes of the political world, I could recruit 30,000 people in Ethiopia. Thank you very much for your hard day to listen to me. I hope that I could meet you someday later to tell you our stories and our contributions to the shared destiny of mankind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Zhang. Mr. Zhang's story and his company's story is, a, is actually a reflection of the 40 years reform and opening up in China. We hope that we could have more time to listen to Mr. Zhang's opinion and I still have another Q&A session. It is, we are going to conclude the round table five today. Thank you very much for all of you's contribution. And I really want to thank Mr. Zhang to tell us such a wonderful and moving stories. Thank you for your patience. We are going to meet someday later. Let's take a group photo together. If you have time, we can take a group of two together. Thank you.